Well, thank you very much. I uh, am very uh, honored and pleased to be here. And uh, even though my knowledge about your, your institution is very uh, limited, I understand uh, in the last uh, few years, quite a few uh, NGOs and uh, especially think tanks uh, came into being in Turkey. And uh, I can understand uh, this think tank uh, consists of not only many uh, experienced uh, diplomats and uh, government officials, but uh, academicians and people in many other uh, walks of life. And uh, so it's very, uh, in fact, very uh, powerful and influential think tank in addressing some of the critical issues. And I'm told that my uh, mission is to exchange ideas with you concerning uh, China, especially the so-called uh, peaceful development and peaceful rights of China to give some background. Uh, maybe I say a word about myself. I um, was born in China, then in, then in China, 1940. And um, I grew up in Taiwan from uh, uh, the fifth grade through college. Uh, then I received a fellowship and uh, I went to the States. Uh, to I did my graduate work at Harvard University. And then I went back to Taiwan, my alma mater. I gave my first course when, uh, in 1966 uh, on cultural China, uh, no, on uh, Chinese cultural identity and its modern transformation. Uh, then uh, I had an opportunity to go to Princeton. I taught there for about four years. And uh, then I joined the University of California, Berkeley for 10 years. And then uh, since 1981, I was uh, asked back to, uh, to teach uh, at uh, Harvard University until 2010 that uh, in the United States, you know, you, you don't have to retire. So you can, even if you are a molecular biologist, you can till, teach until 80. You know, most of the students understand what happened yesterday, but you're still talking about evolution. <laughs> but uh, nobody can fire you because you're a tenured professor. But anyway. I decided to leave and I um, went to Peking University in China and established the Advanced Institute for Humanistic Studies. And uh, this all related to my own work, uh, which began very early in my career, about Confucian humanism and its modern transformation uh, up to date. So my uh, view of uh, China is from a particular angle, uh, not a political analysis necessarily and uh, not too much of an economic analysis but more of a cultural obs uh, observation. Uh, but since uh, this uh, pervasive mi misunderstanding of how you analyze a society from a cultural point of view, so many people just believe when you do it from a cultural point of view, uh, in fact uh, you are speculating. Uh, you are not doing something uh, solid, empirically solid. Uh, there's an anecdote uh, you, some of you may know that uh, um, a professor at Sloan School at MIT, by the name of Lester Thoreau, and um, he's uh, a very famous scholar uh, in Asia, and uh, one, of his, one of the things he, he does is prediction. Uh, most of his predictions are wrong, and he continues to predict. And so uh, I know him very well, sometimes I joke about it. After the collapse, uh, after the, uh, not just collapse of the Soviet Union, after the, the collapse of the Berlin Wall, and he did a book, I think some of you may have read it, it's a best, one of the best sellers, it's called Head to Head, uh, basically a comparison of three cultures, or three uh, nations, United States, Japan, and Germany. It's the only three players now on the international horizon, and he uh, predicted with the tremendous confidence that Germany would be the winner. Uh, maybe he's right, you know, because Germany is certainly the winner in Europe. But uh, I know him, I asked him, uh, you know, you travel to Hong Kong, Taiwan, and mainland, you talk about this and that, why you didn't even mention China? Oh, he said, Wei Ming, you are a culturist. So you talk about great culture and so forth. I am an empirical economist. And I look at the statistics. The Chinese economy was one-tenth of the Japan's. So maybe 50 years from now, we'll worry about China. Of course, he, he's wrong, but he's still predicting. Right. <laughs> uh, 
and then a, a good friend of mine who's a, a political scientist and also a very important one for Asian studies, his name is Thomas Johnson. And uh, we collaborated a number of times. And he said at one meeting, you know, like, like uh, this small meeting, he said, well, my difference uh, from Professor Du is this. I'm an empirical uh, social scientist. So I want to discuss things that is practicable with policy implication, and hopefully I'll be able to influence uh, politicians. And Professor Du is a culturalist, and he never visits uh, Washington, D.C., because if he gives his uh, lecture on Confucianism, most of the senators would, be, would fall asleep. So it's relevant. So he said, uh, uh, Du is a culturalist, <coughs> and I am an institutionalist. You would talk about MITI, you remember the very important organization. And he said, if I said MITI plays a very important role in uh, Japan's development, the senators say, yeah, maybe we should have our own MITI as well. So very practical. Uh, then he decided to leave UC Berkeley and went to uh, UC San Diego and joined a group of economists. These economists were all interested in Japan. So uh, he's a Japan, uh, Japan expert fluent in Japanese and he even reads uh, Japanese novels. So he discussed with them and then he appeared, you know, he felt a little bit uncomfortable. He said, you people know Japanese? No, 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 we don't study Japanese. He said, are you sure you're studying Japan? He said, well, we, we follow you. There's no need to worry about culture. You know, we, are, we have the statistics and we study it. He's very, very angry. He said, you know, I'm a culturalist. If you don't study Japanese, how can you learn about Japan? In other words, uh, you, you know, the arrogance in America, if a New York Times reporter, you showed up in, in China, three days later, you begin to fire reports about China uh, without knowing a word of Chinese, right? This is, this is changing, but changing is still very slightly. But anyway, then uh, I don't know whether you heard of uh, a scholar by the name of uh, Edwin Reichow a great man in both Sinology and Japanology. You know, he, uh, he studied in Beijing, Paris, and Kyoto, uh, and, and then became an American ambassador to Japan, and uh, published this famous book on uh, Japan, uh, J Japan uh, today. And uh, he, uh, in fact, uh, was so celebrated as a scholar and diplomat, and the NHK uh, carried a six-hour documentary about him and followed him to Paris, to, of course, Cambridge, Massachusetts, to China, to Kyoto. So a great man, and also a culturalist. And he made a prediction, uh, only one that he made. He said, no, I never do the prediction thing because uh, I want to study a classical Chinese thought. His uh, dissertation is about any, was uh, in Tang Dynasty, which means seven or uh, eighth century, a Japanese monk who traveled to China and uh, left a record. So his study is about China perceived by a Japanese monk. So his uh, classical Chinese, classical Japanese knowledge is terrific. So he gave a talk to the Trilateral Commission. I, I don't know whether a very famous uh, organization influencing American foreign policy. He gave an gave a oral presentation. And uh, one of the scholars was so impressed, so uh, recorded it and asked uh, him for permission to have that published. And it's an eight-page article published uh, in Foreign Affairs uh, in 1974. Remember, 1974 was one year before the end of the uh, Vietnam War. The Vietnam War ended in uh, 1975. And uh, I think the lecture was given uh, in 1973. So the title is very interesting. He was criticizing the, what we call Japanese exceptionalism. Uh, many people talked about Japan because Japan was so powerful. So many people say Japan is uh, sui generis. And no East Asian countries managed to do that. And Japan alone became such a powerful state. There must be something uh, very, very unusual about Japan. The Japanese said, yeah, we're very different. We're not like Chinese, even though we got influenced by them. We, uh, in fact, uh, develop our own indigenous competence. Uh, his uh, article is intended to be uh, a critique of Japanese exceptionalism. And of course, he's a uh, leading Jap uh, Japanese, uh, Japanese scholar, so his view 
uh, has to be taken very seriously. The title of the article is uh, very interesting. It's called The Cynic World in Perspective. S-I-N-I-C, meaning the Chinese. So we say you, ha you have anti-Semitic, you know, you're anti-Jews. You can be anti-Semitic, <laughs> meaning anti-Chinese, right? So anyway, it's called The Cynic World in Perspective. So in the very short article, he said, look, if Japan's success economically is not only confined to economic, political, social factors, there are also some, fact, some ideas about uh, values, about culture, and so forth, then these are some of the things that help Japan to be successful. If my observation is correct, these are some of the values and this kind of, uh, you know, thrifty and all, all kinds of interesting observations, you know, organizational technique, loyalty, and the group action and so forth, then the four areas will definitely develop. And uh, at the time, I don't think we have all these four mini dragons or tigers. So he identified South Korea, uh, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore. And then the next one, next move is even more interesting, is that uh, now we're in a terrible shape. Uh, no, Vietnam is a terrible shape a country in ruins. But if Vietnam managed to get its act together, become a rebuild, Vietnam is part of this, uh, uh, this world, Vietnam will develop. To the end, only two sentences. They say China, no one would know what. If, however, China changed this totally outmoded uh, economic system, which means planned economy, there's no, I, I have no doubt China will grow. Now, a, a uh, page article, and uh, probably in my view, is worth, uh, is superior to maybe the dozen of books uh, published by uh, Leslie Thoreau. That's a culture. Of course, my bias, right? But my uh, approach to culture uh, is not reductionist, and certainly not culturalism, as people say. As if, uh, if you get these values, you're going to get this kind of uh, economic social systems. This is uh, a very, uh, superficial, naive, uh, even a misleading use of the Weberian thesis. Weber's never a cultural reductionist. So his uh, book on the Protestant ethic and the spirit of the capitalism is not a reductionist model. So my methodological position is simply this. If a phenomena uh, occur, such as a financial crisis, and uh, the economists, you know, including the uh, quantitative economists, like econometricians, will be able to explain the phenomenon fully to the satisfactory of the economic uh, community using uh, simply economic uh, rationality. That's enough. So the economists uh, don't have to worry about externalities. They just focus their attention on these essential issues. You know, you know for a while, uh, the economists never take uh, environment important, as an important factor, certainly not culture. Uh, I think, uh, you know, very, very bright economist, uh, Jeffrey Sachs, he himself is very, very uh, sensitive to culture. He loves to sing music and uh, very sophisticated in literature. But as an economist, he's to totally insensitive to culture because he doesn't believe the culture plays a role. Uh, recently, he became, uh, you know, sometimes he played with ideas. Recently, he became, uh, I would call, call him, uh, uh, geographic uh, determinist. You know, he's uh, made the observation, why all these countries in the South uh, didn't produce any uh, major thinkers, you know, and so forth. So say, maybe, it can't, maybe yeah. place, geography plays a role. This is an old, uh, outmoded uh, cultural observation. Uh, maybe ethnicity played a role, right? You can say maybe language played a role. Why German philosophers are so great? Because the German language is logical. Uh, why Chinese uh, don't produce Hegel? because the Chinese is poetic language. You know, th these kind of uh, reductions is all, mode, mode, uh, all totally uh, all moded. However, if the observation purely from the economic point of view fails, you know, like the financial crisis just occurred, you know you have to do something else. You have to evoke the factor of the government, role of the government, political. So politics we have to bring in. If you don't even know politics, your economic calculation would be very shallow. Now, if you still fail to explain the phenomena, you have to get into society. Habits of the heart, 
uh, social, social inertia, uh, family system, all these things you have to analyze. But you still fail. Then you have to evoke the culture. Uh, the reason that uh, Reichauer was right and uh, Lesser Thoreau is basically misleading is because Reichauer, as an American ambassador, is totally seasoned economics, uh, politics, so society. He, of course, will take for granted all these things uh, he knows. And then a step further. So if you want to use cultural analysis, it is absolutely imperative don't use it uh, in a deterministic or reductionist way. So I say culture is added value. If you are involved in cultural analysis, you better be aware of the social factors, aware of the politics, aware of the economics. You cannot afford not to be aware. Uh, but of course, you cannot be an expert in all those areas. To be aware doesn't mean that you have to be an expert. So you have to read journals like an economist, not economist, you know, maybe even read some professional journals about uh, society and so forth. So culture is the added value. On the other hand, culture permeates every aspect of uh, human experience. Uh, Peter Berger, I think uh, someone may know, established uh, an institute for the study of uh, economic culture at uh, Boston University. You know, the discipline we call the political culture study by Lu Pai at MIT. And you, if you study society, of course, you cannot avoid culture. So, culture is both an added value and also a, a dimension of human experience you cannot afford to ignore. If you study institution without knowing culture, like uh, Charles Johnson's frustration with all these uh, pure economists, you don't even know Japanese language, you study Japanese institution as if you could understand this ridiculous. So culture is sophisticated. If you want to use culture analysis, you better be sophisticated, otherwise you'll be criticized. So that's the, the way, methodological, that's my approach. Uh, I want to begin with uh, a concept that I developed uh, at the time. It was not widely shared, but now it's uh, very pervasive, uh, widely accepted. It's uh, the term cultural China, uh, and I wrote an article in 1989, shortly after Tiananmen. You know, today is the is the June 4th. I don't know Tiananmen occurred in 1989, right? Uh, 1989. So uh, June 4th, after the tragedy and the bloody confrontation, I wrote an article called "Cultural China" with with a colon, the per the per uh, the periphery as the center. So I was. Uh, Huh? The periphery, the periphery as the center. Uh, now I forget who, uh, who uh, gave me the uh, inspiration. There's a notion that the center is nowhere and the periphery is everywhere. Now China as the center in the Communist Party and so forth uh, totally has become illegitimate because they grew to act. And yet many other uh, centers will emerge. Now, I'm not talking about politics. I certainly uh, was not referring to economics. I was referring to culture. Now, culture is something that requires cultivation. It's not your race. You don't choose whether you become a, a Caucasian or not. Uh, you study English, so you become uh, more seasoned in the English language. So culture requires uh, conscious um, self-development, and culture requires an environment. You know, Mencius made a remark, if you live in a state of Tzu, you want to, you want to learn the language of Qi, that's very difficult. You have to, you have to uh, work very hard, like uh, acquisition of a second language. So the environment is absolutely critical, and yet there's something more than just the uh, environment. It, you know, what, uh, what uh, um, Leslie Thoreau um, got wrong, oh no, no, uh, Jeffrey Sachs, was to consider some external factors as determining either geography or ethnicity or uh, language. Uh, so it became a linguistic determinism, geographic determinism, uh, all turned out to be uh, uh, not very satisfactory because you're not being sophisticated. So culture China, in my conception, involves three, I call them uh, symbolic universes. 
and often misunderstood. The first one in, uh, includes mainland China, that's People's Republic of China, but of course uh, Hong Kong, Macau, uh, Taiwan, and Singapore. The reason I include Singapore is because the Chinese population in Singapore is about uh, 76%. So that's the first in modern universe, meaning the world that uh, consists of primarily of Han Chinese. But I will include all the minorities because of the PRC. You know, they, are, they are citizens. Uh, you know, 56 minorities. And China now has major difficulties with some of the minorities, like the Tibetans, uh, like the uh, Uyghurs, and also, I think, like the Mongols. So this is the first one. The second one is uh, the Chinese diaspora. I mean, Chinese all over the world. And I think we're talking about 50, uh, 50 million people or so over the world. And when I discuss this, I use the word Chinese diaspora, one of the participants in the meeting that I organized uh, is uh, Wang Gengwu. Uh, Wang Gengwu is by far the most authoritative scholar of overseas Chinese. He's in Singapore. He grew up in um, Malaysia. And he said the word diaspora has to be spelled with a capital D. And it has to be restricted to the experience of the Jews. You cannot do otherwise. I said, no, no, no. I want to use the word diaspora with a lower key. I even want to use uh, an adjective, diasporic. You know, this is 1989. Uh, shortly after that, and the diasporic studies actually, uh, I think the diasporic studies actually began in the late 90s and become now one of the most fashionable topics in cultural studies, uh, just like uh, migration and others. Now, Wang Gong Wu actually, in a way, is right. If you look at the Chinese experience and the Jewish experience, on the surface, many people say, well, Chinese are like Jews, you know, with emphasis on education, importance of the mother, and sense of cultural continuity. That, that's certainly true. But we know there are 13 million Jews all over the world. Uh, for the first time, the Jews in Israel, now probably more than the Jews in New York, but uh, for a while, uh, Israel only attracts uh, less than half of the Jewish population. But, you know, you look at 13 million, that's half of the, half of the population of Taiwan, first of all. And then diaspora means there's no home. So for the Jewish experience, you know, for a thousand years, uh, the situation changed dramatically after the Second World War. They say, next year, Jerusalem. But uh, no one <laughs> was in Jerusalem. So every, every time, it's really scattered, scattered around the world. China, the experience for the overseas Chinese, is the motherland is so huge and so solid and so magnetic. Everybody, in a way, had to have something to do with it. Uh, one personal experience, my uncle was a uh, Chinese-American and actually lived in America and grew in America and became uh, a pilot, uh, an old plane, but uh, instead of uh, doing any uh, fighting, he, he worked in a circus. Uh, I, I don't know whether you've seen all this uh, twin pilot, the, the way they can do things is incredible. Later, he was invited back to China and became one of the major founders of the Chinese Air Force. You know. But uh, the, re the reason he went back is very interesting. His father's dying wish is that he, he wanted to be buried in his hometown. So this uncle of mine then uh, accompanied the coffin by boat all the way to China to get uh, the, uh, his father buried. And then he settled down there and then married uh, one of my relatives, so become my relative. This kind of, uh, we call it return home. Uh, like the tree, the leaf of the tree will eventually fall on the ground. Very powerful. But the situation only changed more recently is what they call, uh, one is called Luo Ye Sengen, the other one is Luo Ye Guigen, the other one is Luo Ye Sengen. The other idea is you know, no matter where you are, you become rooted. For, for example, you live in Malaysia, then you are Malaysian. You're rooted in Malaysian soul, even, even though culturally you can still identify yourself as Chinese. 
right? So the identity politics of that is very fascinating. That's the second one. The third one uh, probably surprised you. I include, uh, uh, in terms of numerical number, very small, but it's increasing and extremely important. Uh, there's a group of people who are connected uh, with China, neither by birth nor by marriage, which means uh, foreigners, <laughs> Japanese, Americans, Russians, and so forth. Many people say, well, I can only accept idea of sinologists. You know, people study China. And uh, some Japanese actually become great uh, sinologists. Their ability to study classical Chinese better than some of the best Chinese philosophers. That's true, uh, I mean, professors. That's true with many French sinologists. Now, of course, Americans. That's only one. I want to include everyone. Not sinologists, but uh, uh, diplomats, business people. Uh, they don't even speak Chinese, and uh, they don't even want to learn Chinese and uh, journalists, and even tourists. With only ex one, uh, one criteria is that uh, the person's involvement with China is long-term. If you visit Shanghai for five days, and then you forget about Shanghai forever, then you couldn't include that person as part of culture China. Right? If you visit China once, then uh, you become obsessed. You continue to study, you write, and so forth. And those people hate China, and uh, hating China becomes a way of life. And those people who love China, all these will have to be included. So, uh, first, when I, when I talk about that, many people were very, very angry, say, oh, you include the foreigners. So how do you identify Chinese identity? I say, well, this is cultural China. This is not political China and so forth. Uh, fortunately, in Chinese, there are two words about being Chinese. And one is Zhongguoren, which means uh, people of China. The other one is Huaren, uh, ethnically, culturally Chinese. So you can say, I'm not a Zhongguoren, I'm not Chinese in the political sense, but I'm a Huaren, I'm Chinese in the uh, uh, cultural and ethnic sense. Taiwan is a, a very good example. Uh, let's say use the first word Zhongguoren. And when I grew up in Taiwan, it's taken for granted. If you are Taiwanese, you're Chinese. Uh, then gradually, with the rise of uh, uh, regional consciousness, because the oppression, especially cultural oppression, of the occupied KMT, I mean, the, uh, the Guomindang with Chiang Kai-shek, for example, uh, prohibiting the native Taiwanese to use Taiwanese in school, even in, in uh, primary school. You'd be punished, you'd be fined, you have to speak Mandarin, and you don't speak the local language. If China does it today, I mean, today is China very powerful, influential. Say, from now on, the Shanghainese will speak Mandarin, or the Cantonese will speak Mandarin. Otherwise, you'd be get punished. Well, the China, the government will be uh, thrown out of power <laughs> right away. But Taiwanese, under the Japanese uh, occupation for 50 years, became somehow op uh, sort of oppressed, and they continue that. Now, then uh, I realize uh, when you ask some. Uh, people who are Taiwanese, they say, I'm not sure whether I'm Chinese. And then uh, the people say, I'm Ch Taiwanese, I probably am not Chinese. And now 70%, maybe even more, say, I'm Taiwanese, so, so I'm definitely not Chinese. And uh, the case of uh, the, uh, uh, the, the case of uh, the President Li, who actually uh, got China, men in China, angry, again, again, to, uh, because of his uh, pro-Japanese policy and uh, that generation. <clears throat> uh, imagine, you know, I met uh, someone in his 70s. He said, before, we, before I turned 20, before um, Taiwan returned to China, I was Japanese. Everybody, uh, Japanese policy in Taiwan is totally different from any other way. Japanese policy in Taiwan, I wouldn't call it humane, but uh, it's basically an assimilation of Bob model to try to make uh, Taiwan part of Japan. So they, they encourage people to learn Japanese, and if you learn Japanese, you get rewarded, you know, using totally different strategy of trying to bring uh, Taiwan into the Japanese orbit. Then uh, for the 20 years, when, in, when uh, uh, Japan returned to China, so say, I. Uh, was Chinese. 
But then I left China, and now in the United States for the last 20 years, so I'm uh, American. So throughout my life, I've, uh, I, was, uh, I have been um, Japanese, Chinese, Americans. But I know my identity. I'm a Taiwanese. So it's a, it's a fascinating one. And of course, this is very common. Uh, I don't know in Turkey, but in the United States, you know, your cultural identity is very difficult to define. You know, many Jews, right, just originally assume if you're a Jew, you must be religious. Now we know half of the Jews are uh, secular, and uh, some people are even anti-religion. Uh, she wore Eisenstein, uh, you probably know one of the great uh, comparativists in terms of cultural studies. Uh, and asked him, uh, what is your religion? You, do, do you have a religion? Uh, no, no. Uh, whether, whether he's Jewish in a religious sense, he says, no, no, in a secular sense. But uh, do you have a religion? I do. What is your religion? Swimming. I would never go to a conference if it is not five star uh, with a swimming pool because I have to swim every morning for an hour. So, he's, uh, of course, it's a joke, but uh, he doesn't think uh, being Jewish and being secular uh, is incompatible. So that question of chosen to be Chinese, or you have to accept them, even if they don't speak Chinese, as, uh, inf as agents in changing the landscape of China is very important. So my work, in a way, is to understand the interaction of these three. Uh, now, that's the broader cultural context. Let me give you a short historical context, which is probably more important to understand the current situation. When China, uh, you all know the Opium War in um, 1839, when China was confronted with England, and China sort of collapsed uh, in one generation. On the eve of that Opium War, the Chinese economy is uh, even stronger than the American economy in the world context. American economy, maybe 70%. The Chinese economy, according to economic historians, approaching 20. And the two-way traffic, uh, I mean two-way trade between China and England was, ex was almost uh, totally in China's favor. Uh, England wanted tea, wanted silk, wanted porcelain, uh, wanted uh, agricultural produce, wanted ag craftsmen, everything. China didn't want anything from, uh, from England. And finally, uh, because the silver just floated to China, and when opium became uh, legalized, the situation gradually changed. And then you, you look at Rector, this great uh, British uh, statesman, I don't know, Gladstone, uh, made an observation in Parliament, if uh, opium ever became, uh, ever became legalized, it would be one of the darkest chapters in uh, the history of the great British Empire. Uh, he may have been right. And uh, yet, after confrontations with uh, England, uh, China suffered every 10-year period from, nine, from 1839 to the founding of the People's Republic in 1949 for the 110 years. Every 10-year period is a major upheaval. Uh, the uh, Taiping Rebellion, probably 10 million people became displaced, then unequal treaties, then the Japanese aggression, then the collapse of the Manchu dynasty, the, the warlord period, uh, confrontation between the nationalists and the communists. So it's difficult to imagine in that period that you can have, say, more than 10 years of uh, peaceful, uh, peaceful life before, not, of course, the farmers and so forth, they may stay, but for intellectuals, for merchants and so forth, the situation is very uh, fluid. After the founding of the People's Repub Republic in 1949, until the reform, open, open reform, policy formulated by Deng Xiaoping in, uh, let's say, 1970. And every five-year period, in that 30 years, every five-year period, there was a great change. Uh, famine, a natural disaster, but basically man-made. First was China's entry into the Korean War. And when McCarthy, and you know, McCarthy's troops uh, reached uh, uh, the Yellow River, he actually was thinking about using nuclear strike in order to pen, you know, Truman got him out of the picture, he could have used a nuclear strike. Uh, the record that China tried hard to build a nuclear bomb in 1964 because uh, Russia guaranteed 
the Russia's and the sort of nuclear umbrella will help China. Once Mao <laughs> learned about this, wow, got all the scientists, we have to have our own bomb. <laughs> either, either got uh, killed by Americans or got uh, subju subjugated by the Russians. But anyway, and then the uh, Great Leap Forward, 19, uh, 1958, a major disaster from the economic point of view. Then the three years of uh, starvation. Uh, the official record is 25 million people died of starvation. And unofficial, I think I believe the unofficial thing, it's as high as 40 million. Imagine, uh, very few people are aware of it, and one of the most uh, serious, I think, most serious and uh, devastating tragedies in human history. And then the Cultural Revolution. Not only people got killed, culture was wiped out. Some of the best books uh, were burned, and some of the, uh, the treasures of the family, because they're afraid that the Red Guards will come, they burned them burn the things themselves uh, for fear. Well, that disaster, incredible. So then the reform began, 1979. People say, you know, for 30 years within this period of peace, China became a major giant. This is totally historically untrue. Tiananmen, in 1989, is one of the most serious tragedies in Chinese history. And I think the Communist Party lost, lost total legitimacy. And if Deng Xiaoping had not decided to uh, let the economy grow, I think most people predicted that that's the end of communism. Uh, China would have uh, transformed into something else. In fact, uh, many, uh, many overseas Chinese, especially uh, in the United States, uh, help all the dissidents. All the dissidents were great heroes because they said, wait for another six months, they all return as heroes in ruling China. And one case was the Chen Yizi. You know, I was at Harvard at the time. Uh, uh, the uh, e uh, Center for East Asian Research offered him a position to become a fellow for a year, uh, paying him 30,000 US, that was considered high. He got an offer from Princeton for 50. So he went to Princeton. But anyway, and some people waited, and uh, one very famous scholar, he refused to go to China. He's still waiting <laughs> for the collapse of uh, uh, communism so he could go back and uh, be a very influential thinker. Uh, that didn't happen. But uh, certainly very little happened, uh, even in the early 80s. It happened in, in the area of thought, just explosive period, just like the May 4th. Anything that, uh, um, anything that we considered uh, important as ideas in the United States, uh, China grabbed it. And so Jean Paul Sartre was uh, very famous in China. And uh, not to mention uh, uh, the liberal-minded people and so forth. And the irony for me was in 19, you probably all remember, in 1968, which uh, Paris, right, was a very critical year for the young. Uh, Tokyo, Kyoto, uh, Princeton, Harvard, all these universities uh, were involved in the quote, revolution. And Paris uh, was the center. So uh, many of uh, most brilliant minds, um, arguably most brilliant minds in the uh, Western civilization, some of the most brilliant minds uh, became uh, sympathetic to the Cultural Revolution. In fact, uh, many of them became Maoists. Now, the students became a radical socialists, they were Maoists. Uh, Jean Paul Sartre is a good example. You know, he was communist. In other words, uh, <laughs> you have to be a revolutionary. Change the society rather than simply criticize it. And Derrida, Foucault, uh, Cristero, all these people, Maoists. And uh, Hirely Putnam was my friend and also uh, one of the great uh, scholars in mathematical logic. He was not only uh, a Maoist, he was so, uh, he's so more radical than most of the students. And uh, not to mention some of the overseas Chinese professors. But of course, uh, it didn't last very long. Uh, especially the group of Chinese, you know, some people in my generation went back to China and actually worked for the great revolutionary uh, tradition. Because the thing is that 
many, many uh, scholars in the West just believe that communism was the way for the future. Just like in America, I forgot to read, you know, others in the 20s. They said, we went to Moscow and said, uh, uh, famous term, and uh, I am in Moscow, I see the future. So that's a way for the future. Because uh, these uh, existentialists, these scholars, wanted to change the Western man. Uh, corrupt, greedy, capitalistic, no sympathy, and then a new generation of new human beings. Okay. They're selfless, uh, completely dedicated to a uh, revolutionary struggle, and egalitarian. They, they're all dressed like, and uh, gender transcended all this gender differentiation, everything. But that, of course, when China was in the worst possible situation in the Chinese history, the Chinese image in the West was the, the brightest. The situation changed. Now, I, uh, I, I was born in Kunming. I grew up in Taiwan. But uh, before 49, from 45 to 49, I lived in Shanghai and actually attended uh, high school. Uh, I attended primary school in Shanghai. Uh, six of us, a mother and uh, two relatives and four children. My father was in the States, all lived in a very small apartment uh, in Saka. So in 19, uh, 1980, before 1989, I visited uh, that apartment. Their apartment is still there. And the only difference was aged for 30 years. That situation lasted until 1992 when Deng Xiaoping traveled to the south. Nothing happened in Shanghai in terms of renewal, and it only began in 1994. And in three years, the face of Shanghai changed. And as people consider Deng Xiaoping a brilliant uh, strategist. You know, my uh, uh, Ezra Vogel, you probably heard of him, his new book on Deng Xiaoping, uh, very controversial, and really consider Deng Xiaoping more important than Mao Zedong in making China a modern China. My, my uh, understanding of Deng Xiaoping is very different. Uh, Deng Xiaoping is a pragmatist and a very shallow thinker and a good strategist. And what the Chinese Communist Party did under Deng Xiaoping was uh, let off, uh, not controlling, let the people do things on their own. Uh, Chinese peasants are not peasants, they are farmers. You know, the, the Russian, the Russian uh, serfs and the French, you know, in, in French, uh, a lot of words describing the, uh, the farmers are not very complimentary. And even Marx, uh, a sack of potatoes, you know, they cannot think, they cannot reflect. But if you look at a Chinese, uh, uh, this is the power of Confucian tradition, you look at Chinese vocabulary, the farmer is always glorified as honest, as hardworking, as intelligent and so forth. So I would say when Deng Xiaoping decided the party collapsed, there's no way to control and let the people do your own thing. That's the impetus. And then he gave something which now we're suffering a lot. He say, uh, let some people become rich. Don't worry about uh, equality. Uh, what we see, you know, if you, I don't have a uh, diagram, if you see a clause, uh, normally in business school they try to play this game. You have liberty, equality, and then efficiency and uh, so social solidarity. If you have a cross line, for a long time what Mao and others do is to focus on uh, equality and solidarity. And without much attention to liberty and efficiency. And what Deng Xiaoping did was just shift it. And say let some people become rich, so you shift from liberty to uh, a shift from uh, uh, equality to liberty. And you allow people to, uh, to do their own thing, you shift uh, the whole access from uh, solidarity to efficiency. And what uh, Hu Jintao did was uh, looking at China, it's uh, one of the most unequal societies in the world. The, uh, the farmers have been, uh, you know, more than, right now, more than 200,000 uh, workers came from the countryside. If you, if you go to country, countryside, you know either old people in their 60s or at least 55 and young children. 
uh, people in their 40s and, and so forth, they're all gone. They're in uh, cities working. Uh, you know the number uh, is staggering, right? You have about 200 million people migrating from the countryside uh, to the major cities. You just imagine in a phenomenon that Peking, uh, Shanghai, and, uh, and uh, uh, Guangzhou, Peking's population, you know, residents, is 13 million, it's like uh, Istanbul. But uh, there's uh, 10 million, oh no, uh, yes, 13 million, right. Uh, 10 million Shanghainese uh, would uh, migrant farmers. Uh, if you are on the, on the campus of Peking University, you see them every day because they are construction workers. And uh, there's no rebellion. Even though there are all kinds of riots, you know, uh, China now defines what a riot. A riot that has been noticed is uh, a protest involving 2,000 or 1,000. Anyway, it's a, it's a protest. But every, you know, uh, a few years ago when they began the record, is about 10,000. Right now it's probably 70,000. 70,000 so-called riots, they gather together and they want to go to Beijing to protest and the police stop them and, and things of that nature. But most recently, this is a very important event, right? And uh, this group, this village, uh, and got rid of the, the, uh, the mayor because the mayor wants to confiscate, confiscate some of the land. They think it's unequal, so eventually got rid of him and then organize themselves around the Confucian clan organizations. They have the elders' organizations. And the government had to decide whether this is uh, uh, insurrection or this is allowable. So they sent people and they, they observed the situation. They were astonished. Everything is orderly. And they decided that guy, that the official then turned out to be corrupt. The people organized themselves. So, sorry. So, uh, I'm ready. Some of our friends might have some questions. Let me just stop. <laughs> but uh, I, what I really want to talk uh, is what I thought you would be interesting to you. But let's stop. You just ask questions. No, no. Um, no, no, no. I think I follow no. the chair. No, if you ask questions, eventually it will come do you, up. Do you have anything uh, to do after, after this? Yeah, oh, yes. I, I have to, I have to lie rest. down. What time do you need to leave? He needs to rest and he yes. he's flying back to China today. Yes. Oh, Baba. Yeah. Oh, that's all right. What time, uh, what time is it now? It's, it's four o'clock. Four o'clock. Yeah. Pardon me? It's four oh, o'clock. What do you mean Turkish? Oh, you mean the time here? <laughs> <laughs> I'm it's just not. trying to remind you that you are in Turkey. I know. When, when people say Italian time, it means uh, always very late. <laughs> so it's uh, 4 20, right? No, 4 o'clock, exactly. Oh, so my watch is gone. 4 o'clock. Uh, I think depending, I'm, uh, I'm open. I enjoy the talk. Maybe until, maybe until 5. Then, then we leave, okay? Okay, please. Yes, please. You borrow a watch. I would, uh, otherwise, I talk too much. Okay, please. No, 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 please. First of all, I'm for the last few years, it's one of the best speech or I think academic talk that I had the chance to listen. I'm a transdisciplinary and uh, my research. You know what uh, what lecture you're talking about? Uh, the uh, uh, well <laughs> it uh, I work dominantly in mathematics but it goes to history. I'm a transdisciplinary researcher. You? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Sure. Uh, well, uh, but, uh, so first of all, I'm, I'm very much impressed, and I will explain why. And I'd like to have your comments, and with your permission, oh, I'd okay. like to make okay. some comments myself. Sure. I mean, 
that through your speech and your presentation, what's really extremely impressive, it's very rare to hear from social scientists what you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Normally, the social scientist makes this systematic error, systematic error, to the almost 20th century, even now it continues. What I call, it's a rather subset analysis approach and partial analysis. Mm -hmm. In other terms, when you study the socioeconomic phenomena, it is mathematically complex. It's a function of n variables, which tends to be infinity. Mm -hmm. It is mathematically chaotic. In mm -hmm. other terms, mm -hmm. there are no mm -hmm. and there are breaks all the time. Yes. And on the other hand, the predictability is extremely low. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Means that if you deal with social economic phenomena, you have to be very humble sure. and very mm -hmm. modest. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you will make a lot of mistakes. Mm -hmm. in, any, in any case, uh, to my uh, modest interpretation, 20th century in social sciences made huge mistakes. Mm -hmm. especially due to the science methodology, mm -hmm. social science methodology, I mean. Again, well, uh, the, which was dominantly a mm -hmm. subset analysis mm -hmm. without understanding and uh, uh, making the effort of uh, uh, seeing the dynamics of the set structure, mm -hmm. set structure, and going just to the, to the, to the subset, and on the other hand, making partial analysis. In that case, you cannot talk of a science. Mm -hmm. What you do is in reality an, an under-optimal discipline approach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Perhaps I'm too sharp, but I'm ready mathematically to prove mm -hmm. what I'm saying. Sure. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think uh, when you look at the 20th century social sciences in general, they are most of the time I mean, dominantly, they are on the bottom. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, when you gave the example of Toro, let's say Toro, <laughs> I'm not surprised that he's not the only one. Most of the time, I mean, the predictions are, are quite, uh, quite uh, erroneous. And because uh, at the end, they take just a part of it yeah. without looking to mm -hmm. that, and uh, it is short term. And this gave a world, uh, but its implication was extremely negative to yes. the whole century and it continues now yes. Yes. because at the end this approach because what people were doing i worked with seven prime ministers directly myself and with three presidents so i have with all humanity some uh, international and national experience and i observe i'm, I'm a scholar uh, basically i'm a mathematician and quiet but i made the mistake because I wanted to be free to start to study economics. I went only one year. The reason why I wanted to study economics, I was thinking to find solutions to the poverty. And after one year, I said, this discipline cannot find solutions to the poverty because it is so uh, partial and what they teach, in a sense, is, is so limited. And in order to find solutions to poverty, you need to have rather much more complex and uh, approaches uh, in any case. So to that, uh, 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 in a, I was uh, in a nature way moved to what I call transdisciplinarity almost 40 years ago, very young. The economy of trans... Transdisciplinarity. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying so pluridisciplinarity or interdisciplinarity. The term transdisciplinarity, I don't know, perhaps it's me who used it for the first, first time, I don't know who else used it, but I, I used it first 40 years ago, I was very young, and it's not due to my intelligence, purely because I was a poet, my first poem was published when I was eight years old, and I was a mathematician, I was pretty good in mathematics. Mm -hmm. But instead of studying mathematics, uh, in any case, I, I, I'm not going to rule like that. But what I'm trying to explain here during this one year, I observed that, and then I never went to, to the university. But still, I had I got my degree because you were not ob obliged to go to the to, to follow the lectures. 
you could uh, just purely pass the exam during This June. is in uh, Europe or in, 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 in Turkey, in Turkey, in Turkey, <laughs> in Turkey in the faculty of economics. So mm -hmm. that's what I did for the remaining three years. Mm -hmm. And I got my degree and even I got an OECD scholarship to do my PhD. But I never went to the university for three years, but I went to the university to follow just is, um, uh, the, the, the lectures in mathematics in uh, uh, history of art, in philosophy, etc. That's what I was following. I apologize, I'm too long, but I will come at the end why, and uh, I'd love to have uh, uh, very much your, your comments. Uh, again, uh, yes, uh, uh, since you raised the question, sir, uh, uh, I insist on the concept of transnational me also, who brought to the OECD this concept of transnational when I was ambassador of Turkey to the OECD because they were using interdisciplinary approach, pluridisciplinary. I was saying this is wrong, scientifically, it's wrong. Why? Because when you say interdisciplinary or pluridisciplinarity, a mathematician, a historian, a philosopher, an economist, they come together, each of them writes his paper, and then you get together. It's a sort of synthesis. This is not transdisciplinarity. Well, transdisciplinarity is the target problem, the very problem, socioeconomic problem. So complex, chaotic, and low predictability. What you have to do, you have to look at to the problem. Uh, and all the people, I mean, the mathematician, the economist, the sociologist, the philosopher, the historian, they have to, in a sense, try to understand each other's view. A mathematician must try to understand why the historian thinks that way in solving this problem, mm -hmm. and vice versa, so all these people. So through the IT, it, uh, uh, very continuous iterations, at the end you target the problem and you try to find a solution. So this is the transdisciplinarity. I think 22nd century, 21st century must move as a science methodology, especially in social sciences, to the transdisciplinarity. In physical sciences, it's already because uh, uh, with nanotechnology, especially yes. with nanotechnology, yes. you are in transdisciplinary. Sure. Sure. Mm -hmm. Again, I'm sorry. So what I will come, this was one of the huge mistakes, uh, mm -hmm. and I personally yes. suffered, but the world has suffered from that. We refer to the wor uh, world uh, crisis. World crisis is completely a result of this very limited science yes. methodology approach yes. in the center, especially yes. driven by United States, yes. its famous universities, uh, citation and that etc. All right, I perfectly understand. I mean that you have to be. I mean, that, but at the end, they limited, really. They limited, and they created. That. I'm not uh, surprised. I had known also Jerry Jeffrey Sachs when I was working for OECD because I worked also for OECD Secretariat for computers and communication, but at that time he came to the economics department, Jeffrey Sachs, and we worked together, I mean, it was that. So, uh, uh, these brilliant people, I mean, at the end, when you were talking to them, you were seeing that at the end, what they do, they, they were taking, in reality, what uh, we, we, we don't know about the absolute reality. As a philosopher, you can perfectly um, interpret that. Uh, to my understanding, absolute reality can be only at the level of what I may call of the belief system. Yes, yes. In, uh, in positive science, we can talk of observable, observable, um, uh, observable, uh, uh, relative, and uh, probabilistic reality. Mm -hmm. So, in that sense, uh, 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 even the university teaching is wrong now. Sure. We, uh, uh, instead of teaching, at least uh, certainly you have to be uh, a specialist. Sure. Means that you have to teach out of 360 degree observable reality, but uh, you have also to teach 30 degree, but the linkage of 30 degree which remain in 330 degree, because the reality, the observable reality, is not 30 degree. It is 300 and you can perfectly be, uh, I don't know, an economist, a philosopher, but in economics is linked with so many things, I mean, with uh, history, with philosophy. Uh, so I'm, I'm really very much impressed that for the first time I listened to uh, a great scholar that at the end you endogenize uh, at the end uh, with the humility. I mean, as uh, you say, that just it's an added value. Culture is extremely important.
Why? Because culture in the Gadamer sense, the uh, things uh, in German uh, methodology is Gadamer, the answer of uh, Gadamer, the permanentics, as you know, this uh, famous contribution, permanentics, to go to the initial signal. So if you realize if you do science, you have to go to the initial signal. Most of the time, we don't go to the initial signal. So in that sense, again, it was another source of, of mistake in science. And all these problems at the end through the 20th century, and all of these approaches, economics, etc., will rather partial analysis, uh, under optimal uh, approaches and solutions. And I have seen so many people just writing, I don't know, one page on economics, this is the solution, Mr. Prime Minister, if you do that. Yes, but if you do that, its implications in medium term to other factors will be rather highly negative. So it is just a partial analysis. You can find solution uh, to the problem in a part, but when you take the system, you will deteriorate in a non-negligible way. They never took that. And because that we had this world economic crisis, why? World economic crisis is at the end the result of this famous, what I call, all this teaching gave a mechanistic, mechanistic, mm -hmm. short-termist, mm -hmm. short-termist, mechanistic, and highly a, a big, huge alternative cause, mechanistic, yes, and, and with huge alternative cause. And at the very end, we have this clash. It was not. Why? There, there's another factor, which is a very important explanatory variable, which is the ethics. People never take into consideration ethics. Ethics, I have a theorem on that, on 1998 theorem, which I presented at the uh, Quito University in Ecuador. I am a member of the Club of Rome. It was a, um, a conference of the Club of Rome. So the theorem is... The Club says, of... Uh, of Rome. Of Rome. Of Rome. Not the Club the of Rome. Yeah. Yes. The limits yes. to grow. To you. I'm sure that you They are yeah. the Club of Rome. The Club of Rome. I am a yeah. member and for 15 yeah. years. Limits I, to grow. I was yeah. its executive board. Gosh, anyway, I want to join them. Sorry? <laughs> I want to join the Club of Rome. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, uh, so uh, I presented to this tour in 1990. It says that to reach any optimal at the level of individual, uh, corporation, institution, nation state, or international sphere, all variables may change in time and space dynamics. The only factor what, which must remain as a necessary condition, I don't say constant sure. in mathematics, because then it would never change. Right. It's the ethics. 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 If you don't yeah. have ethics, mm -hmm. you will never reach the all. So, the, sure. the, the, sure. so at the end, uh, I explain in my papers and uh, writings and in my teaching that at the end of the 2008 world economic crisis is a crisis of ethics. You must be ashamed. Absolutely. Absolutely. Must be ashamed. Absolutely. And, and then uh, it's too long. And the existing <laughs> EU crisis yes. is a, uh, it's a crisis of structural heterogeneity. Because there is no, I this is another theorem of mine, there is no EU optimal. Mm -hmm. If anyone can explain to me that there is a EU optimal, I would like very much to prove mathematically that mm. it doesn't exist. Because you know this famous mathematic, uh, mathematical term is that if you take the optima of subsets, if you aggregate, you don't reach the optimum of the set structure. Mm -hmm. You have 27 countries. Can you imagine Germany and uh, Bulgaria or uh, Cyprus or uh, South Cyprus? I mean, it's like if you, uh, the, the differences are so huge that right. you can never reach the optimum in such a heterogeneous structure. Mm -hmm. Economically, politically, etc. Et so long, and I will finish here so to listen to you and to learn from you. Um, I think we need, uh, I mean, as you mentioned, we, we need no, not prediction, but on speed of analysis. On speed of is very important because there are some ch chances that you can already see. <coughs> and if you from now see that what may happen with a low probability of error margin in five, ten years' time, then you can make an on speed of analysis now and solve the problem with one unit now. If you wait five years, you need at least 10 minutes for it. If you wait perhaps eight years, it's too late. You can never solve the problem, it's over. So um, 
uh, uh, someone that we would uh, I'm sure know him uh, perhaps even personally. He taught more than 30 years in Stanford, in French, René Girard, mm -hmm. the mimetic theory. You know, that he explains the impact uh, of uh, past generations to actual generations and to future generations. It's very impressive. It's a very important contribution to social sciences and reality. Uh, so, uh, in that sense, what uh, I was taking note. And finally, perhaps, uh, when you refer to, 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 to um, Jean Paul Sartre, I mean, I told you that also Professor, uh, invited Professor, because I'm Professor at Bilkin University in Ankara, but also I'm invited Professor at the University of Paris. I thought originally I was Professor at the University of Paris, so it continues since 1979. Anyway, um, I, did, so when, yeah, I did my PhD in, in Paris, and uh, I remember all this time, I mean, it's really, uh, I'm embarrassed to say that it's a job. Mm -hmm. What Mr. Salt explained doesn't explain 2% of the real human reality. All this existentialism is a job. You know that, it's for this reason especially, I'm so, uh, I mean, furious that because uh, we were uh, uh, so much uh, under the uh, influence of people like uh, Salt and others, Whole story is a so much more positive. I mean, as a culture, so on, etc. But in the case of uh, of thought, thought in an ashamed way said, "You must never write in gulags." Yes, but gulags means that millions of people were killed by Stalin. And he said, "You mustn't write on gulags because if you write on gulags, then you will have a negative impact on socialism or Marxism." Well, I give up to you. Everything you are, I mean, it's, 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 if you forget the human being, the ideologies, I mean, it's, 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 even the religions, I mean, can yeah. resist a certain time, certain ideologies don't resist more than a few decades. So, um, sir, I'm sorry, but I wanted to share with you my modest comments because really I was very much impressed, and for so long time I didn't hear, I mean, uh, an intelligent and uh, approach and broad approach to science, and I'd like to hear from you now. I apologize for being so long. Let me first, yeah, let me first uh, make a request. Uh, do you travel long distance now? Or? Oh, yes. Oh. So uh, try to find the earliest time we, our Institute for Advanced Humanistic Studies, will invite you as a distinguished uh, lecturer. I, I, I'm absolutely serious. I think uh, uh, not only the uh, uh, people in social sciences, especially quantified social sciences in the West, but especially people in China. Because China has been so much overwhelmed by the enlightenment mentality, narrowly defined. So the ideology in China today is not socialism, liberalism, or Confucianism. It's an outmoded scientist. And that scientist is a positivistic scientist. You know, building the three gorges. It's, a, it's a incredible. First of all, your idea of unintended negative consequences. That was not calculated. You can't. And uh, the sense of uh, arrogance. You know, I, I would say the combination of ignorance and arrogance. The ignorant about so many variables they need to know. And you are, you're arrogant. Uh, well, let, let me change the topic just a little bit. United States, uh, I'm a naturalized citizen, even though I'm now in China, culturally, uh, was a great learning civilization. So we learned from France in terms of language and uh, legal systems, learned a great deal from uh, no, I mean, learn from England and learn a great deal from France about political institutions, liberty, equality, and learn from Germany about sciences. And so America was one of the most dynamic and transformative countries in the world. After the Second World War, uh, with the Marshall Plan, with the American tutelage over Japan, it turned into a teaching civilization and continues to teach until now, especially during the Bush administration, 
the American soul, not just the American uh, power, but American soul has been compromised. So right now, how to regain the American soul? In other words, the American sense of uh, self-worth and being a part of a really vibrant uh, transformative power, this is very, very difficult. And uh, even uh, Obama it, it actually was very impressive and when he became the uh, president for six months, and especially after his lecture at, uh, uh, at Cairo. Just incredible visionary. And yet uh, he's now totally, how do you call it, uh, co-opted by a system. It's, uh, it has no power of uh, transcending self in uh, national self-interest. This is, this is tragedy. But Chinese situation is not promising, precisely because this uh, commitment to an outmoded idea of scientism. In fact, it's not scientism, it is physicalism. That's using, using physics as a model. If you get things smaller, 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 you get to the moment, you can construct the world. But if you get it smaller, it, it's still complex. So people doesn't know how to do it. You know, it's better to, to uh, uh, understand reality either in terms of the biological model, chemistry model, or, or best not to use outmoded uh, scientific model. I had one experience. Uh, uh, I never meant. You know, I shouldn't mention that uh, because it's totally, uh, um, totally um, suspect uh, in China today. But uh, I don't mind. And uh, with five leading scientists. One in uh, relativity, one in uh, quantum mechanics, one in astronomy, and one in optics, two in optics, to Damasala, and to discuss this uh, with uh, His Holiness Dalai, Dalai Lama for one week, every day from nine to five. And uh, it was a genuine, uh, originally for these uh, great uh, scientific minds we were there to teach him you know, how to be modern, right, and how to be uh, uh, how, how to uh, be, become seasoned in the modern uh, fields of, of uh, physics. But it was a genuine uh, dialogue between science and religion. And uh, the kind of spiritual side of the modern scientific inquiry is very pronounced. Very pronounced. And, uh, and the kind of, uh, uh, the, uh, especially the, uh, uh, the scholarly relativity, they say, how do you know uh, why we can understand the world out there, nature, you know, we get to the moon. If there's no structure within the human uh, mind that's corresponding to the reality also, how, how can we just by randomly hit it? And uh, so the guy uh, uh, from, uh, uh, from Vienna in quantum mechanics and uh, uh, belonging to the, Copen uh, the Copenhagen school, and uh, he said Einstein never accepted quantum mechanics because uh, uh, he, think, he, uh, he thought a god would never play with dice. Probability is not reality. But we know, uh, if, if you look at science from the, from the perspective of the, human, uh, the humanists, then you realize that uh, it is not the reductionist, quantified and physicalist approach. But uh, the more approach, uh, you, you, uh, you, uh, you mentioned uh, Gadamar, that's from the uh, Shalaya Mark, and also this, this approach, uh, especially Vico, and it's humanistic. But now I believe this humanistic mode of thinking, the way you described uh, your understanding of the problem, is not only important for people in the humanities or in social sciences, but it's important for people in science. That's right, a decision system in particular because it's complex. And why it's important? Because by recognizing complexity is uh, not only humble, to be able to, not to anticipate, to be able to sense. I think I like your notion about, uh, uh, that's right, a problem T. In Chinese now we say the Wen Ti Yi is not the problem you're going to solve, it's the consciousness of the complexity of the problem. If the problem, any problem that can be solved is not a major problem. Yeah. All the problems of meaning cannot be solved. You have to live with the problem. You don't solve it. 
you know, any like Wittgenstein used uh, two riddles. Uh, one riddle is the riddle that you can solve, but the other riddle is the riddle of life. You you cannot solve, and yet the riddle of life continues challenges humans for self-reflexivity, for understanding. So these are really powerful forces now uh, in the world today. That's, that's the reason in the 21st century, uh, religion features most prominently in many of the fields. Uh, even, uh, even the World Economic Forum, Davos, which I think uh, was the instrument for the development of uh, market fundamentalism earlier even in, uh, in the turn of the century it began, you know, Schwab, Schwab and others realized that religion. So uh, I was invited, not because I was a uh, good economist, <laughs> but uh, the question of religion became important, uh, the question of meaning, the question of identity and so forth. So in this, there's a new kind of uh, epistemology. And so after our discussion with the Dalai Lama, the, a book actually came out, it's called uh, uh, cosmology and new physics. Uh, these are not ordinary scientists. You know, one is from Advanced Institute, Princeton, and uh, one from Georgia Tech, and uh, the relatives, and the other one from University of Vienna. Cosmology and the new physics. So it's a, it's a conceptual change of, uh, of what the world ought to be. So then we can say the leadership in the 21st century, in addition to uh, economic uh, capital, the importance of social capital, Social capital is based upon inter, uh, I, I call it, uh, you know, Habermas notion of communicative rationality, not just instrumental rationality. Right, right. Uh, in addition to uh, technical competence, we need cultural competence. And then cultural competence is complex. You know, uh, in terms of technical competence, if you go to a university, you know the people who are freshmen know less than the people in sophomore and so forth because it people But in terms of uh, cultural competence, a high school student may be more superior um, to a college student. A sophomore may be more intelligent than the professor. It's, it's a different, uh, different how you read it, how you look at the, uh, you know, the, uh, the information, not just as information, and how to organize the knowledge, how to develop, even very young, uh, uh, a kind of wisdom. You know, normally we confuse data with information, information with knowledge, knowledge with wisdom, and we don't talk at all about spirituality. But spirituality. You know. so, so that's the problem. Then uh, uh, another thing I totally agree with you is uh, in addition to cognitive intelligence, which is quantifiable, there's an ethical intelligence. Of course, uh, some people use emotional intelligence. You know, the word emotional intelligence, again, came from the Dalai Lama's dialogue with a group of uh, psychologists. So they decided, you know, this is a brilliant psychologist. It's not enough. And of course, uh, we all know the um, material conditions, but there's also um, spiritual values. Now, in that case, China, uh, you know, I, I jump ahead because there's a, a lot in the middle. China now suffers, in this sense, the leadership suffers from two blind spots, serious blind spots. One is their inability to understand religion, broadly defined. The second one is their insensitivity to identity politics. Because these are all engineers, you know, they train not even as scientists. Uh, engineer, ma many of them trained uh, in Eastern European countries. Uh, so it's the old Soviet model. So first of all, you know the Falun Gong case, uh, as you know, right? The Falun Gong, the Buddhist case. Uh, the, uh, you know Falun Gong, right? Just imagine of a set of, of that kind, the whole country, the, the government used all the uh, a Paris, you know, all the uh, forces at its disposal to get rid of it. And the situation is worse. You go to Vancouver and say, where's the Chinese consulate? I can't find it. No, 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 no don't worry. If you see a group of Falun Gong protesting with a, with a, with a tent outside, that's where it is. <laughs> so in San Francisco, in New York, everywhere. Li Peng once came already, you know, uh, uh, I, 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 I witnessed the situation. It could have arrested by the uh, New York police, uh, just like the French uh, 
you know, the French, uh, well, uh, potential uh, president candidate and, uh, and got arrested because of that particular incident. Yes. So, it can. But the much more serious problem is Tibet. Really serious, but they have no sensitivity. Uh, Hu Jintao went to Washington and talked to Obama and said, we have two problems. Uh, I have two complaints. Uh, if we can solve these two complaints, that all the other issues are uh, easily dealt with. One is that you sell weapons, still sell advanced weapons to Taiwan. Taiwan is part of China. And why you continue to do that if you want to develop uh, a friendly relations? The second is why you always uh, receive the Dalai Lama? Why, you know, the only way you receive Dalai Lama is to unite all these foreign anti-Chinese forces to humiliate us. Now, the first one, I think America is totally wrong. There's no justification of selling weaponry to Taiwan. The second one, it's the stupidity of the Chinese leadership. Dalai Lama and the Tibetan culture can be one of the richest cultural resources for China. You know, just, uh, just imagine that China now has the Buddhist Vatican in, in her own territory. Because if you want to find a Buddhist, Buddhist Pope or Buddhist uh, leader, because Buddhism is much more diverse, right? that's Dalai Lama. And instead of uh, embracing this uh, precious uh, uh, spiritual force, uh, decided to say, well, he's a separatist. Uh, no matter what he says, it's always intended to be uh, uh, independent. You know, when Tibet was under British control, and all these uh, foreign powers in control, China had no way of dealing with it. Now Tibet is part of China. What kind of foreign influence? So they are afraid of what uh, some people can find it to be as the Khomeini phenomenon. So what happens now is that uh, um, unless China, Chinese leadership, can cultivate social capital, cultural competence, ethical intelligence, spiritual values. They're not able to deal with uh, uh, either Falun Gong or, or Tibet. The second one is that they fail to appreciate the complexity and the explosiveness of identity politics. You have 56 minorities. And uh, what China is trying to do is to use, you know, instrumentalize the policy simply to use minorities as uh, an integral part of their tourism. If you look at India, so China will have to take India seriously as a reference. Uh, India is one of the great uh, exporting civilizations so far as spiritual values are concerned. But, you know, Buddhism became a powerful force in China for centuries. From India and uh, Indian uh, didn't say any army. <laughs> China, China was so so much overwhelmed by the spiritual value of India that they went uh, almost sacrificed their lives in order to get the sutra, Xuanzang and others. So this is a real soft power that people don't understand. Now, John Nye's attempt to say we have to do something to increase our soft power. You're not going to get soft power if your approach is instrumental. The Chinese government tried to, to uh, I think, millions and millions of dollars to get a screen in the Times Square uh, to give a vision of China for this. It's counterproductive. Nobody would believe a thing of what you say. So if you want to have a harmonious society, you have to first you know that uh, harmony depends upon differences, recognition of differences. So, uh, I mean, we apologize. Uh would you mind if we end the talk here? Okay. So, uh, since we know that you are so tired and you need some rest before uh, taking. I'm okay. Yeah. Yeah. What, so, I'm very busy. What time is it? Uh, what time do you have? Uh, we, we are, we are, yeah. we are okay. the host and it's yeah. a special talk that uh, you know, they, they, you know, they were going to go to the other weekends. No, we end at we end at five. We end at five. We end at five.
Yeah, many of you continue to ask questions. Yeah, you are tired, 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 you are Uh, okay, I, uh, uh, the one you, you, uh, uh, you mentioned uh, about uh, over-specialization, so you only get uh, either a partial, uh, a subset, or a distorted picture. So you need to have a more comprehensive, but yet the complexity is not based upon abstract universalism. So how you, how you uh, uh, try to integrate Uh, universalism, which means cosmopolitanism and ecumenicalism, with uh, the concrete humanity, concreteness of a highly localized situation, you know, your ethnicity, uh, your language and so forth, without falling into the trap of closed particularism, and especially aggressive particularism. This is a big problem. So China, uh, I think the Chinese economy um, was slow, And, but uh, many people believe the Chinese economy will continue with some kind of vitality, but there's a lot of room for doing that. Uh, Chinese politics uh, may not disintegrate. Uh, corruption will continue and all kinds of things. But the most difficult problem is uh, the new Chinese identity, cultural identity. What we want to be and what we want to perceive by others. And there's nervousness. I think one thing about China now is nervousness. So the Chinese state is a paranoia state. And uh, sometimes the paranoia is self-generated. So this uh, idea that China is perceived as a threat. And there are all kinds of mechanisms to try to do that. So because of this uh, seriousness, I, I mean this uh, mis, uh, I think misperception, uh, um, the money that's spent to maintain internal security now surpasses uh, the military budget. The highest budget. You know, the other one is uh, entertainment, so the officials. So, you know, Chinese like to eat and drink and so forth. <laughs> and that's how you corrupt uh, uh, your, uh, your associates. But anyway, because this nervousness, uh, harmony is totally understood as uniformity. So my argument that harmony, the necessary condition for harmony is difference. And the opposite of harmony is uniformity. And how do you celebrate difference? Because this kind of scientific mind cannot understand complexity, cannot understand the other. So the big problem is how to deal with the other, especially radical otherness. You know, Clifford Geertz talked about the liberating experience of confronting radical otherness. But Norm in, in China now, there's, a, there's a, such a fear that if you let people express themselves, if you do that, the whole system will collapse. The system will not collapse, and maybe the party's legitimacy will be questioned. For example, one thing they can do is to, uh, to follow Vietnam. At least the party members could vote for the new leader, rather than this internal, so the decision, internal decision. Of, There's a great deal of uh, division of labor within China, on the top nine people, division of labor, uh, because there's no strong leader. Uh, Hu Jintao is a nervous leader, and also uptight, not very imaginative. So in that case, you, you see, uh, the, uh, of course, people are worried about this new uh, problem with Chongqing. Right? You know the case with uh, Bo Xilai. Uh, well, People worry about that. But uh, the more intriguing question for me, the premier, for example, Wen Jiabao, uh, gave uh, an interview with uh, uh, Time magazine or something. And uh, that was not reported in China. And it was uh, edited. Quite a number of things were edited out. So people say, my gosh, Wen Jiabao doesn't have the freedom of speech. It's, not, it's a division of labor. For example, these nine guys, One person who is a very conservative person, uh, Li Changchun, is in charge of propaganda. 
Oh, he can say this is no good. Because if you this kind of things you say, it would uh, uh, disrupt this harmony or security. So you can add it up. The name of Dalai never appears. You know, if the name Dalai appears, even on a computer, they would uh, just add it up right away. And they, they're so nervous, they, they watch everything and they know they cannot do anything because uh, the, uh, the net is so powerful now in, in China. Whenever there's a confrontation, the official will be criticized. Whenever there's a confrontation, the wealthy will be criticized. There's no, no way uh, an official will win a popular uh, contest. No matter how right the official is, how much he was victimized, he'll be persecuted by the, uh, by the net. So, so the society is, uh, is not stable. However, the leadership, we hope the next generation, the leadership, it's, you don't need a lot of intelligence. You need enough self-confidence to allow the flexibility. The society has incredible dynamism and some kind of order will emerge. For example, now the idea is that uh, if you set the limit here very clearly, uh, you people can do everything, but you don't do this. You don't challenge uh, the legitimacy of the government. You don't challenge the Chinese territory integrity or some, something you can reach here. The government is, has no guts of saying that's the case because no one is really in control to say this is the limit. So there's no limit. So people do all kinds of things. You know, you'd be surprised some of the things that are not allowable in America or in Turkey. You can do it. There's a lot of freedom. But uh, the problem is uh, you have to worry about the consequence. They get you afterwards. So most of the people worry about that, so, so their standard is much lower. If you have strict standard here, people can come up here with the dynamism. If you have no standard, people hide themselves here. So a great deal of dynamism and, and uh, opportunities are lost. And this is uh, really unfortunate. So, uh, well, I have, uh, you know, what I can do is very limited, but I do believe if we do it right, especially in terms of foreign relationships, and China begins to have some sense that uh, uh, we are not being uh, just uh, surrounded by uh, evil forces. But we have friends, and these are genuine friends. Turkey will play the very good role. Uh, I, I'm absolutely sure that two countries that will emerge, you know we talk about the BRICS. Uh, one is Turkey, the other one is uh, Indonesia. And part of the reason is because of leadership. It's incredible how leadership can transform a society in 10 years. It's just incredible. And China doesn't have this kind of leadership. And Xi Jinping, uh, Li Keqiang probably is more because he's a good uh, uh, Peking University graduate, must be good, right? <laughs> but uh, still, but I'm not sure. I, uh, they, there's no, no uh, enough uh, imaginative power and no in, uh, not enough charisma. Um, why Turkey can, uh, in, in two senses, one is uh, what happened to uh, the uh, modern history or the recent history of Turkey. Uh, because the, the process of modernization in Turkey exactly is the rhetoric of the current government. Westernization right? and also modernization. Uh, and in fact, secularization as a precondition of modernization. This is the legacy of the founding father. And yet, you know, my two experiences with me, the first time I came was 1966, on my way back to, from Harvard to, uh, to my alma mater. And I really enjoyed my stay in, in um, Istanbul for about a week. It's one of the most beautiful cities, right, because uh, you have water and so forth. And it's, uh, it's the gateway of the East and West and uh, some scenic spots. But I just felt uh, Turkey basically is a secular country. You have all these masks, but basically a secular country. The rhetoric, governmental rhetoric, everyone. The second time I came, maybe 15 years later, with the, the, uh, all these masks, masks uh, emerging, uh, and music in particular, music. And uh, people decided to veil themselves <laughs> as a sign of protest, and which is really quite interesting. You know, if you go to France, it's just the opposite. But anyway, the second I came, I suddenly realized there is a cultural renaissance. 
a kind of religious sensitivity emerges, which is not normally we just interpret it as uh, either reactionary or backward, but it's not. Uh, it gives uh, a deeper sense of your cultural identity. So the Ottoman uh, again becomes uh, uh, a complex history to be studied, analyzed, and critiqued. So the culture becomes thick. And then with these uh, incredibly uh, impressive, charismatic leaders. So I think uh, Turkey is in a very good position to say to China, look, don't worry about all these traditional powers, you know, you know Confucianism, Taoism, allow them to flourish, and they're not going to undermine uh, your ideology. In fact, it's important for, for socialism to learn from your own tradition, and the socialism to learn from uh, the West. So there are three. Oh, okay, go ahead. Actually, uh, it's complementary to what you're actually saying, um, and also to what you remarked on earlier. Uh, it, from the movement of social science, the branch that studies this uh, vast human sort of last 100, 110 years as a positivist sort of empirical science, something got lost along the way. And it, I don't think it's only in China, I think it's something in the States that's going on too. When I was there at Georgetown, um, we were seeing just this massive loss of the metaphysical explanation, the phenomenological explanation of things. Um, I think it got curtailed after history's bad experimentation with uh, fascism and the deal with the militarists. But um, from what you're saying, and it sounds a lot like uh, it's in cohesion with what I heard as rhetoric at Washington as well. Um, it's this sense of we need to re-understand what the soul of a nation is, as opposed to what merely the study of components are. And, and uh, physics can actually lead the way for this, can uh, I mean, like the Heisenberg principle. I mean, just taking a look, when we believe that light travels in, in straight lines, and then we see it travel in waves, so they can actually bend. You mean the uncertainty principle? The uncertainty principle, principle right. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, even physics can actually say that it's not black and white like this. Sure. It, it, empiricism, positivism, can lead the way. Sure. And secondly, about China, um, communism, or, or generally speaking, the left is reorientating itself. It's reanalyzing its, its sort of existential, if you will, um, purpose. And now they're focusing more on the actuality of communism as opposed to the, the end point of communism. Uh, Aliyam Badiou, for example, has been talking about the secrecy of Istanbul not so long ago. And um, they're reshifting and analyzing how metaphysics can actually explain the left and not just uh, historical materials. Uh, I don't know how that is going on in China, but uh, uh -huh. from what I hear, within the party circles, within outside, at least in the philosophical realm. Uh, leftism there too is becoming somewhat of a religion in, in, in some forms. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not just a cult of personality, but sure. a, a sense of soul of sure. China. And, sure. and, and, and I don't know what, what your opinions are on this, but... Okay. My, uh, again, my experience based upon my uh, uh, actual encounter with uh, minds and uh, the current situation. Um, the first time, you know, I was born in China, the left, uh, 1949. First time I returned was 1978 for a month traveling. Then I stayed uh, in China for a whole, whole year as a Fulbright uh, research scholar. Uh, then I decided to teach Confucian philosophy at Peking University in 1985. Uh, when I was there, and uh, one of my colleagues told me, said, no, this course was taught before, only once. I said, when? It's 1923 uh, by Liang Su. So of course, Confucianism is studied in history, literature, but as a philosophy. The reason I want to do it is precisely the question you raised. You need to have a, you need, not metaphysics, <coughs> You need to have a worldview. Uh, you, you have a new, I, I call it a new and creative, often it's imaginative rethinking about being human. In other words, the question we, we now face is rethinking the human. Why, uh, why are we here? Who are we? Uh, the question is not a question of, for philosophers. And in fact, the formal president of uh, of Germany, his name I forgot. He, he uh, invited a group of people, all foreign people, uh, to his home for a conversation. Uh, these two questions: Why are we? Uh, who are we? <laughs> Why are we here? Uh, this, uh, but uh, I, I was not able to go. But you know, these questions 
are questions for statesmen, for business leaders, uh, for students, and it's I think for all the public intellectuals. And I define a public intellectual as someone who is politically concerned, socially engaged, and culturally sensitive and informed. In other words, uh, interested in the public public square or the the public sphere, as the Habermas talks about. And there are three forces in China. And uh, it happened in the 1980s. Uh, in the 1980s, totally uh, incapable of integrating the three, but the people subscribing to different orientations continue to interact, debate, and argue among themselves. But in the 90s, there's a real split. The liberals will no longer talk about the, uh, talk with the new left, and only the Confucians you know, are willing to talk to everybody. And the Confucians are not very powerful, not very influential. It's only emerging. The three forces are first uh, still very powerful, even though not government, you know, government is particularly nervous about them. You know, the people who got arrested, uh, the Nobel laureate, all belong to this. This is still a kind of liberal-minded idea of uh, democracy, freedom human rights and so forth. And this is the force that unleash the market dynamism. But this is also the force that made the market uh, not a blessing for China, but uh, China has transformed itself into a market society. The marketizing force penetrated every as aspect of Chinese life. Uh, university, now, we, we all know that, but even religion. You go to a temple, and these, uh, these monks are no longer are practicing some kind of spiritual discipline. They transform themselves so into accountants. They charge you an entrance fee. They will, they will ask you for, you know, you have to burn incense. And, and they do everything, try to maximize their profit. <laughs> they become the, what I call the uh, economic, uh, economic animal. Uh, but, it is the liberal tradition that eventually will help to establish uh, not only democracy but the uh, strength of the civil society and also the legal system. And hopefully uh, also uh, develop uh, a roadmap for China's ability to join uh, other democracies. Uh, then you have uh, the socialist, return of socialism because of the uh, income distribution problem uh, poverty reduction and so forth. China was just amazing that managed to to uh, to enable 700 million people lifted out of poverty, strict poverty in about 10 years. Unheard of, unheard of in human history. But at the same time, the danger of China that incapable, for example, this economic downturn that lead to all kinds of riots and so forth. That's that's a real possibility. And this reminds me of Scala Pino, who died, uh, more uh, died in his 80s. And when I first met him in uh, the 60s, he had already predicted China's disintegration for about 15 years. So he continued to, to, to watch the signs that China would disintegrate. Uh, when he turned 80, you know, they still invited him to travel everywhere. And he said, well, probably we're going to disintegrate soon. The Chinese do that. <laughs> Now, China will not disintegrate in the normal sense because China is a great civilization, a continuous civilization that's the basis for nation building. And the nation building process is still going on. So Lu Xinpai is made of a, maybe made an observation in, in jest that China is, is a civilization pretending to be a nation. Uh, it's a very complex uh, uh, phenomenon. And so socialism will help to address the question of inequality and how to turn to, uh, uh, you know, how to, like uh, John Rawls' notion about justice. Uh, fairness is to, uh, to turn toward the, uh, um, the silence, the marginalized, the uh, uh, disadvantaged. And Confucianism is a great cultural force for identity. Right now there's a debate in China uh, some of the very, very conservative uh, uh, communist leaders say, we are communists. That's our identity. I said, well, you know, when, when did communism come to China? 
we know for sure during the May 4th when uh, there was a cultural renaissance, every tradition imaginable in the West be became, uh, uh, re China was receptive. Uh, liberalism, uh, vitalism like Bergson, and empiricism uh, you know, like Rousseau, anarchism, Kropotkin and Bakunin, and pragmatism with John Dewey, utilitarianism, and many forms of socialism, but not communism. Li Dazhao first talked about communism in 1921. And the book, uh, Das Kapital, the original uh, German version, was brought to uh, China by a great Confucian thinker, Ma uh, Yifu, uh, and it became translated into Chinese in 1911. So during the May 4th period, socialism was nothing, or, 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 or communism. But then in the 20s and 30s, everybody was a socialist was a Marxist. What happened? Uh, all kinds of interpretations. Mine is simplistic, but I think uh, they're worth uh, considering. Because the collapse of the Chinese system, you know, first the military defense, uh, then industrial uh, structure, then uh, social order, then eventually cultural identity. So to be Chinese is very difficult. In the sense of the humiliation, sense of impotence, sense of uh, helplessness, and so forth. So we see that in novels of Lu Xun and so forth. So they became very iconoclastic. Uh, they think the culture is worthless, the Confucian tradition in particular, because it cannot save. The important thing is how to allow China to survive as a uni unified country. So all these very, very powerful attacks on the Confucian tradition based upon a fierce commitment to patriotism. So you have a phenomenon, just imagine this. You, you're rejecting everything that shapes you as who you are, as a concrete human being. You reject everything, because you know uh, all these forces, none of these forces will help you to become modern. You think the only values that eventually will help you to become modern, you, you do not know yet, because you haven't experienced it. Yet. Everything you know, you reject, and what you want, you don't know. Right? So the, the situation is, uh, when Levinson made an observation, I think I don't ac accept it, but it's very intelligent, that is emotional attachment to the past and inte intellectual identification with the West. So the past is no good, but everybody is part of the culture. So we have this incredible emotional ties to the past. And you agree that the West Intellectually, you agree the Western values are absolutely clear, but you have no emotional intensity to understand what that is. And it's ridiculous. Now you, uh, well, we, we cannot say it's ridiculous. At the time, it's a, a real challenge. We can say at the time, a strategy developed, accepted by quite a number of uh, really brilliant intellectuals. That is the, the worst of the worst in the Confucian tradition was compared to the best of the best of the West. Uh, what is Confucian tradition? It's uh, hierarchical, it's uh, corrupt, it's feudal, um, it's uh, male chauvinistic and so forth. And worse, opium smoking, foot binding, and uh, concubinage. What is the West? Liberty, equality, democracy, rationality, human rights, and so forth. So when China got first exposed to the West, two values feature most prominently. Liberty and human rights in the 1990s. In a very short period of time, they were replaced by two other values. Even today, you know, go to China, everything. Science and democracy. But science and democracy, science has nothing to do with the spirit of science as we understand it. Science is a way for us to become strong. Democracy is not democracy. Democracy is mass mobilization of people. So that's how China deal with the situation. And then you have a situation, uh, unprecedented in human history, that's the, uh, that's the 1917 revolution. You have someone called Lenin. You have Marxism, which is uh, Western to the core, which is the most advanced thinking in the West and yet it's fiercely anti-West, anti-imperialism, anti-colonialism and so forth. My gosh, 
this is our treasure. We love the Western ideas, so represented by a uh, Leninist, later even Stalinist uh, communism, and we hate the West precisely. We want to fight against imperialism, fight against colonialism. So in the 30s, almost everyone of any, uh, of any uh, intelligence became a Marxist. So the, the master narrative, which is now being uh, for the first time challenged, almost accepted by everyone in China, is the China decline from the Opium War uh, to the founding of the People's Republic. China had no hope whatsoever. The nationalists, you know, Chiang Kai-shek, all these people couldn't save China. Same as said. China can only be saved by communism. And not communism in general, not Chen Duxiu, not, not, uh, not uh, uh, Chu uh, Chou Bai and others. The rise of Mao within communism is a great power. So Mao unified China. So these three things, right? China declined, communism emerged, and Mao helped communism. So he's a savior. And now there's so many different kind of narratives. Uh, one is challenged in Taiwan, which has, has a lot of pre persuasive power. Uh, I know for sure that Shanghai, you know, you go to Shanghai, some people say Shanghai is even, uh, certainly more dynamic than New York. You go to Shanghai for, for 1949 until 1994. Long period. Shanghai didn't change. Just old. No light, nightlife. Nothing. But if you look at Shanghai from 1919 to 1949, Shanghai was one of the most uh, cosmopolitan cities in the world. And when Natsume Soseki, who is a very, very creative writer from Tokyo, went to Shanghai, it's almost like uh, from Kansas to New York. Everything in Shanghai is uh, fascinating. And uh, according to one account, the books published in Shanghai in that period uh, surpass all the books published in the United States. Just Shanghai, one city. And uh, Shanghai was mo one of the most culturally diversified societies because many, many foreign concessions, <laughs> the French Quarter, the, 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 so forth. And Shanghai was a combination of the super rich and uh, the poor. And the Shanghai is center of crime, but also center of uh, the best entertainment you can imagine. Two symphony orchestras. One conductor, I forgot his name, is one of the great conductors. Oh, by the way, I uh, managed here, we managed to listen to uh, Beethoven's uh, Symphony 9. I don't know whether you got the, the beginning of this uh, music festival. And acoustic, you know, in the music. Terrific, you know, I just see and also the chorus. But anyway, Shanghai was very vibrant. So now the question is asked, the Shanghai of today, is it better to compare it with uh, Shanghai 1919 to 1949, or 1949 to uh, 1949 to 1974? Mostly, that period and the communism with Mao is uh, one of the uh, most boring and uh, uninteresting and oppressive period. Shanghai, you know, Shanghai people are very resentful because a very large part of the, of the text of Shanghai was transferred to uh, Beijing. Canton, this Cantonese is very smart. They negotiated with Beijing in terms of fixed amount. Maybe say um, 500, uh, you know, uh, 500,000 or something, you know, just a figure. It would stay the same. Okay. Was, pardon me? The rate. Yes. Okay. Shanghai is a percentage, 30%. So Shanghai just uh, got squeezed. And, and the Canton, my gosh, now almost like the real estate uh, from 1,000 1, per square meter to 10,000, and still the, the rent is exactly the same. So the people become, so Shanghai people are very angry about that period. So the Shanghai Expo, you know, why the Shanghai Expo? Shanghai Expo is to show we are just as good or even better than Beijing. You know, Beijing is the Olympic. This is the, uh, the competition between uh, Tokyo and Kyoto. 
Uh, in the United States, I don't know. New York is so unique. Oh, what happened in, uh, in uh, Turkey? Do you have two cities that are competing? Ankara? I don't think any city can Nobody compete. Nobody can compete actually with this standpoint. Yeah, that's, right. <laughs> that's right. Uh, we agree. But, but anyway... That's, I think that's why actually they are now trying to correct me if I am wrong. Um, uh, they're trying to bring all the uh, economic businesses to and this is, you know, what Shanghai wants to become financial center. You know that yeah. uh, because they're also trying to combine, uh, make, combine the timings between East and uh, you and mean the East, Istanbul? In Istanbul, right. so I think in the the, morning, uh, they they can sure. market with East and then in the afternoon with West. You know, I think um, yeah, maybe uh, Istanbul and Shanghai should become sister cities or something. I think that combination, you know, combination between uh, uh, China and Turkey in general, you know, now uh, 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 Turkish uh, citizens can go to China without visa. It's un unheard of. And there was a military, uh, <laughs> military sort of uh, alliance or military between China and Turkey. I think the Western, the NATO people were <laughs> extremely nervous. Uh, but anyway, I think that that is a very interesting development. And uh, I just, uh, you know, because uh, you are, you are a uh, foreign minister, uh, the son of David. <laughs> son of David, should, uh, no, Davo Gukuru. And a very close friend for various reasons. Uh, I came here for a meeting in 1996. We're on the same panel. There's and I met. Oh, sorry. You go ahead. There's one notion, though, that, that is going up from in, in Turkey now. The Turkish public or Turkish society, new kind of students like us, we are not actually getting the same inspiration from Daoud Oulu um, that we used to get two years ago. Oh, cool. or, so or his popular let, let, popularity let, let, no, is declining? Let, let me put it on, in, on another way. Uh -huh. Maybe Daoud Oulu is not enough for Turkish students and that is uh, so the Turkish Turkish students becomes even I mean, more, like even more, moving, more, more, moving faster. Yes, than uh, than leaders. <laughs> Normally, it's like that. You know, we, we have to accept the fact in uh, in the twenty first century, the younger you are, the more equipped you are with all the uh, technologies, especially information and uh, communication technology. There's no way you can compete. I'm, uh, you know, I just look at people doing things. Uh, for example. Uh, it's possible for someone, normally I was trained to concentrate on one thing, you know, read the text, concentrate. Right now, you can play with this, you, you call your friend, you're singing, you're watching, you f six things at the same time. They're all done well. And the jobs are tra changing, you know. My son, uh, just one word about my son, uh, he graduated from Harvard in English literature, totally committed to, uh, to the great uh, enterprise of poetry. And his uh, thesis, senior thesis, was a series of uh, poems. And because when he was a freshman, he was uh, accepted by, the, by uh, the teacher to attend a seminar in graduate school. And so his poem, uh, the series of poems, was so superb, I'm sure, that gave the highest price. Normally, for uh, college kids, you give 200 US, it's an honor. He, he received 15,000. Oh, no, no, 1,500. And yet, I made a mistake I didn't know. When he was in Hong Kong, uh, as uh, uh, in his junior year, and a friend of mine, uh, Fred Hu, who was, uh, I know he was a very successful businessman, but I didn't know what kind of business he was involved in doing, now I know. And uh, I said, uh, uh, Yalun, my son, should have a summer intern job. Can he offer? They said, oh, okay. So he worked in Hong Kong. And then in his uh, senior year, he's offered a position by Goldman Sachs. <laughs> he worked for Goldman Sachs as an intern. They liked him because his math was good. So they sent him to New York for training five weeks, then shipped him to uh, Hong Kong to be one of the analysts. And I called him and said, wow, gosh, this is ridiculous. This is not human. This is incredibly uh, dehumanizing. I want to become uh, a poet. And it's very difficult to write. 
earlier. And I said, Dad, you know, my salary now is better than yours. <laughs> I said, are you sure? I said, yeah. I said, get out of it. Are you going to write? I said, yes, of course, but I think I really should have my, my financial security first. I said, that's the end of it. And uh, he now left uh, Goldman Sachs. I said, great. But he joined another company, which is even more rooked. <laughs> so he would never become a poet. But he can still write. So sometimes he would write a column in uh, Boston Globe. So, oh, everybody said, no, he has a, he has a column. That, uh, has an article published uh, in Boston Globe. I look at it. It's not in commentary. It's not serious. It's about cuisine in Hong Kong. <laughs> And uh, now, I think as a humanist, I consider this a major loss. And a daughter of mine, uh, actually is the most talented, uh, she decided to go to China and stay with the family, it doesn't speak uh, a word of English. So she learned Chinese that way and she can read, she can write, um, she can um, even compose uh, little stories after two or three years. And yet, she's not interested in doing anything, uh, uh, anything so-called significant from the marketplace. So he said, he said he wants to do all kinds of things, you know, to get almost like Australians. You know, the, the idea of Australian mentality, you try to earn some money. Once you have enough money, you travel around the world. And uh, when you, when you, you, uh, you know, spend all the money, you go back to uh, Australia and try to work for a year and get the money and then you travel again. She's, her mentality is like that. Her Chinese is very good. I asked her, she went to Oberlin and said, please continue with the Chinese. I said, well, Chinese is not that difficult. <laughs> I'm interested in Arabic now. <laughs> <laughs> one, one little note. Yes. Istanbul and Shanghai, they are all the sister cities. Oh, really? Yeah. In 1989. Oh. When? In 1989. That early? That early. Wow, that's so why, they, that's they why... Have, um, they have that vision. Of course, <laughs> they so they were, pro they were prophetic. <laughs> I'm totally behind. So when, uh, when uh, the son of David <laughs> was in Shanghai, uh, that was the celebration of the Turkish National Day. Mm. And he sent note, asked me to be there. I suddenly realized only I and my wife were two uh, non-Turkish people. I said, maybe there's some problem with us. <laughs> you know, why only two of us got invited? And they said the, uh, uh, the host would like to uh, talk to you. And yet he offered uh, a, a ride back from Shanghai to Beijing in his uh, private jet. Mm -hmm. So my wife said, wow, <laughs> what an honor. But we had too many uh, pieces well, of luggage. So let's, let's uh, ask our friend to uh, send them by, by mail or by, uh, by, uh, by train. When I went to the airport, you know the private jet? It's a 747 because uh, they rented a huge airplane from the Turkish airline. Mm -hmm. So 300 business people, 100, 100 journalists, diplomats, want to uh, fly to Shanghai for coming. That's the first time I met you, right? Yeah. In Shanghai. Uh, actually, I didn't meet you there. Oh, you didn't meet me there? Yes, How I, come I, come? I, meet, uh, I meet Mr. Doto, but didn't meet uh, other people. Anyway, um, so we regret it, we didn't bring our, <laughs> bring our suitcase <laughs> with us. And uh, then uh, in, Zhang, in uh, Beijing, he said, uh, I'm going to have only one meeting, very important strategic meeting with the people in the uh, Shanghai, uh, it's called the Shanghai International Relations College. It's a major think tank for the government. Uh, would you join us? He said, as part of the uh, Delegation? He said, yeah. So when I arrived, of course, they knew a little bit about my work. So, so you have a group of Chinese on this side, you have a group of uh, Turkish. Uh, Turkish on this side. My name was there. <laughs> I said, no, you didn't invite me, though. They said, yeah, but uh, we got the note that you'll be coming. But I'm not coming. I'm coming as a member of the uh, Turkish delegation. So I took the <laughs> over here. <laughs> Uh, every, everybody laughed a lot. <laughs> but I don't speak a word of Turkish, as you know. <laughs> we have to go. <laughs> yes. uh, perhaps uh, I don't know with your permission. I, mean, I don't like that. I would like to ask a question. Or make yeah, maybe one more. Uh -huh. uh, 
But one thing uh, I want. Uh, yeah, yes, do I have your name, Carl? Uh, yes, I will give you. <laughs> if I may have just two minutes. Okay. Minutes. Yeah. Um, we we'll watch the time. Um, <laughs> yes, because uh, again, it's really so very nice to collect your opportunity. Just uh, a few comments. First of all, I'm concerned with spirituality. Right. In 1975, André Malraux. At that time, he was in France, and, uh, Minister of Culture, Minister of Culture in, in China, China. Man's Fate. And uh, one of the best writers of 20th century. Right, Man's Fate, he wrote that. Yeah. Andre Maro said in 1975, mm, uh, si les tendances continuent ainsi, peut-être que l'humanité ne verra pas la fin du siècle. Right. If these tendencies continue as they are now in 1975, humanity may not see the end of the 21st century. So he was referring that we should move to spirituality. Can you imagine a Marxist and a theist uh, like Andre Malabo in 1975? Incredible. That. Incredible. This, the other comment, sir, was on This, uh, the this uh, reminds me, I want to say something yes. to, uh, after your comment. Please. Yeah. Um, uh, the, uh, on uh, Obama and in general, or not really Mr. Obama, in general on, on, on states and, and politics. Unfortunately, today in 2012, the, the world cannot have any more state men, state ladies. Uh, the equation is very simple for them because politics today requires finance, yes. second media and groups, religious, ethical, etc., 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 etc. And uh, it may go in some countries till mafia. If you have such an equation, yes. this equation cannot lead to have state ladies or state men. Right. You know, we, today we have politicians. Right. Because the system doesn't allow really the state men to stay in politics right. because of this situation. Right. And I would not very much to have your comment. This is also yeah. not my equation in politics. And yeah. then you observe, yeah. because at the end, the finance uh, which comes from the public money right. is never sufficient. Right. We need an extra. Right. And most of the time, this extra is really illegal or creates an ambiguity uh, and complexity. Okay. And also, on the other hand, on the average, the, 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 uh, concerning the transnational companies, right. the top leaders and sure. the top managers sure. are much more clever and intelligent Absolutely. than the average politicians. Sure. Sure. Since they have the finance, they finance politics, but also they transmit their ideas. Mm -hmm. At least, for example, the, mm -hmm. the, 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 the Gulf War was dominantly, sure. in reality, uh, induced by the transition sure. companies' mm -hmm. managers, sure. and the politicians plays the role as porte-parole. Yes. So they uh, tell to the... the I, I they, 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 they. So this is one of the... Like, and I want to tell you a comment, because this is, unfortunately, what I call in my work, and. Uh, I must transmit to you some, some of my graduate lectures, what I call System 2. In other terms, the System 2 says that today, in 2012, the world is driven by power and power of money. And if it continues that, uh, that way, there is no sustainability. All right? In cumulative uh, world, uh, sense, the world is getting richer. We reach $69 trillion. But in terms of income distribution, we look when you look at the gene coefficients and large scales, uh, the 40, almost 40% 40 of the world population, quite, uh, 3 billion human beings approximately, lives with less than $2. So you cannot have sustainability in such a uh, completely contradictory situation. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I'm not blaming the rich countries, but this is a fact. And the ones that they must really take solutions, find solutions, first must be the rich countries. Because they are yeah, in the United States. States. Uh, and the other one. Two dollars so. per day. Yeah. Per day. Yes. Per day. Less than two dollars yeah. per day. Yes, less than two. And finally, sir, uh, the, 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 my third command. Less than two dollars per day? Per day. Two dollars yeah. per day. Yeah. 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 Or, or, or used to be one per, 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 per Yes, but it's 1.6 billion. Right. Uh, living uh, with less sure. than one dollar. Sure. 1.6 billion. So it's a two billion beings are living with less than two dollars. So in such a structure, you cannot stop human traffic, you cannot stop drug traffic, you cannot uh, stop conflicts, wars, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. 
and you, you will never have stability. Sure. And, so, uh, so. Right. and finally, I mean, uh, uh, following your comments, uh, I think uh, at the end, when we look at the belief systems, yeah. uh, so when I say belief systems, I use uh, at least, I'm not a specialist like yourself, so, but the culture in the more larger sense. And for me, culture covers also belief systems. Absolutely. And you mustn't mis make this mistake uh, of substituting, uh, I don't know, just the philosophy or, uh, I don't know, ideologies, or all, I mean, can be just true mountain. This is very important. But I think we have this human, the inner life, which is extremely important. What makes, I think, belief systems extremely powerful is that the most important problem of the human beings is death. Mm -hmm. So, mathematically, even as a true and atheistic view, there is no any concept which can create the tendency which tends to the infinity sure. of the human being. Sure. Only the belief systems. Sure. And this sure. makes the religion. So, there are three interpretations, at least to my smallest understanding, of, of belief systems. One is purely religious, the real believer. The other one is what I call mathematical. It creates a sort of function which tends to the infinity. And there is never a substitution to the ideologies or any concepts or any, uh, I don't know, mechanistic views or others which can, which can replace them. But the real power is there. Yeah. If you miss that, you miss the system. I see. Uh it probably take me about five minutes, hopefully a little bit longer, to respond to uh, those very inspiring and also challenging questions. Uh, in fact, this is the kind of thinking, and uh, you know, I, I don't want to be too uh, immodest. I've been thinking about that question a great deal, and I think uh, your di diagnostic reading of the current situation totally agrees with mine. So we're all very, uh, in a way, very pessimistic. Uh, you have three richest men whose uh, combined, uh, whose wealth uh, is the combined uh, wealth of all the least developed nations. Oh yes. Yeah. And uh, and uh, so this is an economic field. And then you're actually right that uh, finance in an area is beyond, you know multinational corporations and uh, with, uh, with now the kind of uh, technology, instant transfer, you know, dividends and so forth. So you have people like, uh, uh, like uh, Sorrow and others, um, they can challenge, you know, they can destabilize uh, England, or not to mention Hong Kong and other places. And I remember this one very moving moment in, um, in Copenhagen when the gentleman who sat beside me was Trudeau, before he passed away, the uh, Canadian uh, Prime Minister, Trudeau, Trudeau. Trudeau, yes. Yeah. He uh, listened very, very attentively to the discussion without, without uttering word, uh, any word. You know, I know that he's, uh, he's smart, he's a statesman in some way. And then he read one page. Uh, this was, uh, I know exactly the year, nine, 1995, 95 in Copenhagen that one page is precisely the question that you raised, that states are no longer capable of regulating this incredibly greedy, irrational and powerful economic instrument. And these are the brightest guys and they decided to milk the society dry. You know, exactly what happened in terms of the uh, financial crisis. And the irony is that uh, these people would back to come back to help us solve the problem because they, only they no, supposedly, how to do that. You know, Larry Summers is a good example, you know, Harvard president, right? We are very happy I got, got rid of him, but you got rid of him, uh, and he decided, uh, you know, uh, Obama embraced him, he could do even more harm <laughs> as uh, chief advisor to the American president. And, uh, you know, th these people were instrumental or responsible for many uh, the mess. And yet, uh, because they are smart, we don't know, uh, they have to help us. Obama, you know, the phenomena is intriguing. Uh, you're talking about a president 
who run the most costly campaign in human history. And recently he managed to raise, I don't know the amount of money, in Hollywood, uh, charging every participant about 50,000 or something of that nature. So he could raise a lot of money. And uh, you see, power corrupts. You know, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. The system corrupts. So but money system. Also, also corrupts. The system, yeah, the system, I agree with you. However, I also believe uh, this is the pessimistic side. So there are three scenarios. One is that, uh, well, one is that the human beings are confronted with two kinds of destruction. One is the instant death. That's a nuclear. We, we all know that. Uh, no reporter in Washington ever ask the question, you know, we're dealing with uh, Iran, we're dealing with uh, North Korea, oh, they're threatening, say, we, now we have 5,000 of these missiles, each one of them destroyed the Earth, sir, why do why we want to keep it? We want to deal with France, Germany, or what? Oh, who's our enemy? Or Martians? Why there's no plan to do something about it? No one ever asked that question, as if uh, the, everybody's irrational talking about this irrational, <laughs> Iranian and the irrational North Korea. Anyway, that's, so, and then the gradual death, that's pollution. So we either die instantly or we gradually, we all die. Maybe Mahu is right so that it's difficult to uh, live beyond the 21st century. You know, many of the young people, even the children, dream of the total destruction of the human. Even in terms of the scientific, you know, we, we have imagined uh, science fiction. To say, well, this Earth is in trouble. We all go to Mars. We go to. Right now, we know the knowledge, of course, is limited. It's impossible. We have to be here. We probably would disappear only here if only two or three people manage to escape. It doesn't mean the human race will continue. Anyway, that's one way. The other one is uh, my my friend Jeremy Kagan. His uh, idea is uh, a major disaster whether it's natural disaster or man-made disaster, that uh, people become awakened. We really have to do something fundamentally different, otherwise we're not going to survive. A major disaster. But my hope, and I think your hope, is another way. This another way is not totally unimaginable. System one. <laughs> yeah. This, this way is to say, we ask the question, the meaning of being human, right? We ask the question, is it the time for human beings to rethink why are we here, uh, what is the purpose of life, uh, uh, where are we, and, and um, who are we, and so forth. This question will be addressed, these questions will be addressed in many, many different ways. So the axial age civilizations that Kayaspis talked about, uh, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, and the Greek philosophy, and Confucianism, Taoism, the Hindu tradition, and certainly uh, Buddhism. And I will include all the indigenous traditions. You know, I, was, uh, I spent 14 months in Hawaii at the East-West Center. For the first time, I learned a little bit about uh, uh, indigenous spirituality. That's, uh, that's in uh, Honolulu. In, in that uh, place, uh, the kahunas, the spiritual leaders, women, they are so powerful in terms of the thinking. They are oral, there is no language, but orality becomes a way of a transmission. So, not only these great XOH civilizations, but all the indigenous traditions may help people to have a different way of thinking. In America now, many people become vegetarians, and quite a number of people, including my youngest daughter, is not at all motivated by material goods to do anything. And uh, ask the question, her email was sent, you know, uh, what is supposed to be life? Or what kind of food you should eat? You know, there's a lot of uh, uh, attention to the body, to the earth, and so forth. Now, I end with one observation about Confucianism. Now, you talk about uh, either pure religiosity or pure math. Uh, the Confucian tradition is a very uh, intriguing one. And I think Confucian tradition can serve as a reference, or just like Christianity and others. First of all, it's totally this worldly. Confucius made a choice. You, uh, you know, if we use modern language, there's no kingdom of God that is more significant than the world here now. 
And so to the Buddhists, there's no pure land or the other shore if you allow this red dust to pollute itself. So Confucian is in the world, but trying to transform the world. And so it's not secularism. It's not enlightenment secularism. It's not anthropocentrism. It's not instrumental rationality. It's not uh, separation between the human and the world. Rather, it is an attempt to integrate four dimensions of human experience. <coughs> one is uh, the self, body, mind, soul, and spirit. The second one is our community. The third one is nature, and then you have heaven. Heaven is like God or Allah. So for the self is the integration of the body and mind, and the possible uh, fruitful interaction between the self and the community. And of course, uh, harmonious and a sustainable relationship between human species and nature and mutuality or mutual responsiveness between the human heart and mind and the way of heaven. And now, uh, since I've done, you know, for, uh, for the last 10 years, I've done a lot of dialogue. And uh, one experience of dialogue with the Christians, 1313, and out of the 13 representing Confucians, seven of them are Christians. So you have a Confucian Christian dialogue, which is at the same time a Christian Christian dialogue. I didn't understand it, but I was happy. You know, if it happened between a Christian and Islamic dialogue, you have a, you have a serious problem. Oh, they are traitors, you know, they are, they are um, underground. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, so then the question is, uh, what's the compatibility? And there's a group of theologians in Boston, they now call themselves Boston Confucians. They're all theologians. So the, the Im imagined possibility of uh, a Confucian Christian and a non-Confucian Christian. A Confucian Christian is precisely my definition of a public intellectual. A Confucian Christian has to be politically concerned, socially engaged, and culturally sensitive. But you can be a Christian without any involvement in politics in the faith, or engage yourself in society in the monastery, or you, you ignore culture. You know, some uh, Chinese uh, Christians say he's a cultural Christian, which means he's not a Christian. Can, is it possible for Confucian to be, for Muslim to be Confucian? And this is exactly what happened in the 17th century. All the Muslims, think Muslim thinkers, we've been studying a lot now, they all call themselves uh, Confucian Muslims, because, which means they are scholarly Muslims. Is it possible for someone to be a Jewish Confucian? Uh, in fact, my graduate student, um, uh, Galia Petchimea, her dissertation is on it. So one of her students recently wrote a paper, can I be a Confucian Israeli? So Confucian, the term becomes an adjective, almost becomes Socratic, you know, or Platonic, but anyway, uh, the question of a Confucian Buddhist. And in fact, what happened in recent years is Buddhism deals with life as well as death. Buddhism is what they call human Buddhism, not Buddhism that waits for the nirvana in the future. And eventually, Buddhism that is going to transform this world into a pure land. Uh, all the major Buddhist sects in Taiwan are, the, are like that. So Confucianism because I emphasize the spiritual side of the Confucian tradition. It's not secular humanism. Uh, I was given a lifelong award by American uh, Humanist Society. You know, Amata Singh was one of them, Ed, Ed Wilson. These are great uh, secular humanists. And uh, by giving the, uh, giving the award, my first uh, statement is that Confucianism is not a form of secular humanism. Wow. 800 people there, I thought 400 of them were ready to leave. <laughs> but they stayed. They really stayed. So I said, the kind of new humanism that emerges has to be spiritually grounded. God, Allah, all these uh, great traditions will be major contributions to, uh, to a human uh, survival and uh, flourishing. Uh, I have a few heroes. You know, I'm, I'm not alone here. And if you're interested, uh, you can consult their work. One is, uh, of course, people like Martin Buber and so forth. I mean, uh, people still alive and working. One is uh, Hussein Nasser. Hussein? Hussein Nasser. Hussein Nasser. 
And uh, one disagreement between us is that he hates the West, he hates modernity, he hates modernization, he cannot stand secularism. I love them all in a different sense. So I think he's, uh, he's a little bit too, uh, well, I, I'm not going to criticize him, he's one of my best friends. Uh, the other one is Robert Bella. His new book on uh, human evolution from the Paleolithic to the Axial Age civilizations. Habermas considered that as the most important book after Weber. And uh, Max Weber. Oh. And uh, Charles Taylor also praised that book. And uh, Hans Jonas. Uh, the other one is Charles Taylor. Charles Taylor's uh, meditation on the question of uh, secularization, the secular age, read that book. And he's a Catholic, uh, so religiously very musical. But, uh, and uh, I think Richard Falk, uh, Richard Falk would be a, a colleague in this sense, even though he's not very religious, but uh, his uh, sense for ethics, moral sense, you know, it's incredible courage for a Jew to fight against the Zionists to criticize Israel and to accept the appointment as a high commissioner for human rights in the Middle uh, in uh, Palestine. Incredible. I mean, we've been friends for 20 years and so on. So there are a number of people like that. And uh, so if you imagine, you know, in 1923, a Confucian thinker by the name of Liang, uh, Liang Sumi made an observation. He said there are three different orientations, spiritual orientations in the world. One is the West which is aggressive, creative, expansionist. One is uh, Buddhist. Uh, no, uh, yeah, one is Buddhist or Hindu. That is self-reflexive, tranquility, and try to move beyond any kind of materialism. And then the Chinese way. China now will have to learn from the West, otherwise China will not be able to survive. However, as we progress, the West will discover the Indian way has a very, very powerful reference. If you don't go the Indian way, you're, going to, you, you, you're not going to survive. So the change will have to occur in uh, advanced economies, United States in particular. The United States may change, not because the mind change, because the objective situation forced the Americans to change. Each American now owes uh, maybe 60,000. And uh, worse than, uh, uh, worse than the, the Greek situation. Uh, the art of survival is to print money, and uh, that's uh, not necessarily sustainable. So the, we now know the American way, uh, you know, people say there's only one dream, the American dream, the only one way, that's uh, Fukuyama, end of history, American way. But Fukuyama recently is deeply involved in the study of Chinese uh, governance. Uh, I just had a dialogue with him in, in the Stanford. So, the, uh, the Indian way, I ask people to China to learn from India, and there's a, people now in China say, we have a model. It's not our way, our, our experience, we have a model. I said, that's very stupid. It's an ignorant and arrogant point. The Chinese model, what kind of model for, for India? Uh, so what happens then is uh, the term that I use, and there's a special issue, of Daedalus, uh, American Academy of Arts and Sciences, it's called multiple modernities. It's not multifaceted modernities. So it's not just one way. The American way actually is uh, radically different from the European way. Uh, East Asia become modern, but the East Asian forms of life are different. Now we see the rise of Southeast Asia, the rise of the BRICS, but I think these two forces, two countries, I would say, uh, you know, uh, not uh, in any prophetic way, but just experientially sort of uh, uh, sense is uh, Turkey and uh, Indonesia. And, uh, you know, the Indonesian way is moving, first of all, the leadership. Just, uh, you know, just like the leadership in Turkey, extremely enlightened. But the power of Javanese tradition, one of the very few indigenous traditions that did not only survive, but flourished. And the other one is Shinto. And uh, another thing is uh, we have to be aware of the incredible potential of Africa. Africa now is in major trouble, but if you talk about 
uh, biodiversity, cultural diversity, linguistic diversity, ethnic diversity. Af Africa, after all, is the, uh, the birth of the human race, you know, the, the African mother. I mean. So if all these societies begin to think, uh, right now in society because the communication uh, technology is such. In China, if the, we call the netizens, the people using the net, develop not only a common sense but a good sense, instead of using the net just to, to do violence, they use the net as a, as a way to help them. A different philosophy, a philosophy of life. The spirit of, uh, you know, uh, the final word is the most important term in the Confucian tradition is the word Ren, which is translated as love, benevolence, or simply humanity. And this word is, uh, you know, in the Christian tradition, uh, faith, hope, and love. And uh, in the final analysis, it's love. Not hope. Rather, uh, if uh, hope without love, hope is empty uh, prophecy. If faith without love, the faith uh, is not going to work. So that sense of uh, sympathy, compassion, and um, if people just accept that as a way of being human, I think uh, with now this, the technology, the transformation can be very quick. Um, on behalf of the since is not here, of the president of Wiseman Center, I would like, uh, on behalf of all our colleagues, to thank you very much. Mm. It was extremely impressive. I personally am sure that our colleagues enjoyed it. But she, she really, I, I, I was extremely impressed. Mm. Thank you very much. It's my, uh, <laughs> it's my privilege, and I openly extend invitation to you. I think uh, if you are, uh, you know, uh, I, I would uh, discuss this with uh, with you through email. I think uh, your presence just just. Uh, repeat or even simplify what you just said here will be a source of inspiration for, for China, especially, hopefully, for some of the most uh, brilliant young students. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome.